Her Prince's Secret Past by Cindy Ray Hale. Copyright 2022. Cindy Ray Hale. Chapter 1. Edward walked toward Josie's coffee shop and opened the door. A body slammed into him, coffee splashing all over the place. He tensed up right away. Had they found him? But then he stepped back, blinking and took in a beautiful woman with reddish-brown hair. He let out a sigh. She looked harmless. She was slender and had a faint scattering of freckles across her cheeks. He was immediately drawn to her bright green eyes. The woman gasped and looked at her white button-down shirt. She shook the coffee off her phone and set her cup on a nearby table before wiping at the giant coffee stain dripping down her front. Embarrassment heated his face. I'm so sorry. Can I get you something to help you clean that up? He grabbed a stack of napkins from a nearby table and offered them to her. Thanks. She set her phone next to the cup of coffee and patted the wet spot on her shirt, but it wasn't doing much to remove the stain. Guess it looks like I'm going home to change. Somehow, the coffee hadn't managed to get on him at all, which made him feel guilty. I should have been watching where I was going. Her cheeks flushed, causing her to look more lovely. It's not entirely your fault. I was texting and walking at the same time. He felt like a fool. What kind of clumsy guy who knocked into beautiful women walking into the coffee shop? I should get going, she said. Thanks for the napkins. Sorry again, he said to her retreating form. He turned back to the room, heaving out a big sigh. The shop was cozy, with tables scattered around and twinkle lights strung across the tops of the walls. The line was short, and he took the spot at the end. A young guy with an acne problem bustled about, filling orders, and the line moved forward in no time. He stepped up the counter just as the door opened and more people filed into line behind him. What can I get for you, the kid asked. I'll have a cappuccino. He peered in the case filled with goodies. And one of those cinnamon rolls. Sure thing. He gave him the total and took his money and then swept away to fill his order. You must be new in town. I haven't seen you around here before, an older female voice behind him said. He turned around to see a heavy-set woman with gray hair standing behind him in line, studying him like he was a shiny new toy to play with. Yes. I just got here, in fact. She wore a large-brimmed hat with tacky orange flowers on it. I thought so. She squinted curiously at him. I can't place your accent. Where are you from? He cleared his throat. Somewhere far from here. Well, I gathered that much. You can keep your secrets, if you want. What brings you to Maple Creek? He withheld a chuckle. She said he could keep his secrets, but then immediately started digging for more information from him. The blonde woman in line behind her rolled her eyes. Mrs. Wheaton, leave the poor man alone. I'm sure he doesn't want to tell you all his personal business. She stuck her hand out. I'm Lauren. I own the salon, all dolled up. He shook her hand. I saw that salon on my drive this morning. It's nice to meet you. He glanced over at Mrs. Wheaton. I don't mind telling you why I'm in town. I'm looking for Richard Dalton. You wouldn't happen to know him, would you? Oh, yes. Mrs. Wheaton said. I've known Richard for years. He owns the art museum. That's what I understand, he said. What do you want with Richard? I'm an artist myself. I'm interested in his work. The employee handed him his order. Here you go. He took the cup and the small brown bag with the cinnamon roll. Mrs. Wheaton stepped up to the counter and ordered coffee and a bagel. After the kid left to get her food, Mrs. Wheaton turned back to Edward. An artist, huh? She rose her eyebrows at him. You know, he has a single daughter, who's quite the catch. 
You're single, aren't you? I don't see a ring. Mrs. Wheaton's quite the matchmaker, Lauren said with a smile. She's always trying to marry off the single citizens of Maple Creek. Luckily, I'm married, so I'm off the hook now. I knew you and Chase would become a couple from the first moment I saw you together, Mrs. Wheaton bragged. And you were right. Are you planning to stay in town long? Mrs. Wheaton asked Edward. For a while at least. It depends on how things go today with Mr. Dalton. Have you found a place to stay yet? Mrs. Wheaton asked. I have. I found a lady in town who listed her basement as an Airbnb. Well, that sounds perfect for a young bachelor like yourself. Mrs. Wheaton took her drink and bagel from the coffee shop employee, and Lauren stepped up to the counter. Edward sipped his cappuccino. This is pretty good. Oh, yes, Josie makes the best coffee in town. Just wait until you try that cinnamon roll. It's to die for, Mrs. Wheaton gushed. I can hardly wait. Edward found a little table and settled down with his food. Mrs. Wheaton took the table next to him. Was this crazy woman following him? She reminded him of some of the women from the town back home. What do you think of Maple Creek so far? It seems like a nice place. He hadn't seen too much of the area so far, just enough to drive into town and look around a bit. He still hadn't found his Airbnb yet. He hoped to meet Richard Dalton first. It was his first time in the United States. He'd flown into Roanoke and rented a car before making the drive to Maple Creek, Virginia. Everything seemed much newer and shinier than what he was used to at home. It was an old country, known for its ancient forests and mountains, steeped in rich tradition. You'll like it a lot more once you meet Carrington. Who is Carrington? Edward asked. Richard's daughter. The single one. Mrs. Wheaton opened her bag and pulled out a bagel and a small packet of cream cheese. What makes you think I'll meet her? She runs the art museum, and she lives with her father. She's always around him. You won't be able to meet him without meeting her too. I see. Well, I hate to ruin all your matchmaking fun, but I'm terribly afraid I'm not in the market for a girlfriend right now. Not after the incident with Elizabeth. He needed a long break from women. Mrs. Wheaton gave him a knowing look. That's what they all say at first. She sipped her coffee, keeping her eyes on him like that would help her discover all his secrets. I assure you, that won't be the case with me. Where did you say you were from again? You speak like you're from a fairy tale. Edward had been working hard to keep his accent as Americanized as he could. The last thing he wanted was for someone to question him about his homeland. He must have let his accent slip without realizing it. The woman was getting him worked up, suggesting that he find another girlfriend. I didn't say. That's right. Mrs. Wheaton clicked her tongue. You were being evasive. I prefer it that way. So mysterious. Well, I'll get to the bottom of it eventually, mark my words. She gave him a self-satisfied smile. I always do. His smile disappeared. He certainly hoped not. He knew the woman only meant well and was probably teasing, but it wasn't in her best interest to go digging around in his past. It wasn't safe. He'd come to this tiny place to escape danger. Yes, he wanted to find the painter he longed to study under, but more importantly, he needed to hide. The last thing he needed was a nosy townsperson, digging around to find out more about him. He stood up, gathering his garbage. It was nice meeting you, Mrs. Wheaton. You know, she said, looking up at him. I never did catch your name. Edward. Such a fancy-sounding name. Edward, what? Annoyance flicked through him. Did she have to know everything about him? Edward. Brown. He'd said the first surname that had popped into his head. 
well, Edward Brown. It was nice, to meet you too. Hopefully, I'll be seeing you around town. I'm sure you will. Even if Mr. Dalton wouldn't agree to mentor him, Maple Creek seemed like a good enough place to hide out for a while. He liked the charm of the small town and the friendliness of the people, even if they did seem a bit nosy. He left the coffee shop and headed down the street toward the spot where he'd parked his rental car. The leaves were just starting to change. His heart had been heavy, leaving home. Fall was his favorite time of year. The forests in his country were breathtaking in the autumn. But Maple Creek surprised him with its beauty, and it soothed his homesickness. Pumpkins sat on front porches alongside scarecrows and bright pots of autumn flowers. When he'd left the palace, it was being decorated for the harvest festival they had each September. It would start this weekend. He was missing out. He'd never missed the harvest festival. When he was inside his car, he punched Richard Dalton's address into the GPS app on his phone. It was only five minutes away. He pulled from his parking spot and drove past the shops and restaurants that lined the street. He passed an elementary school and a high school, and then turned down a side street that was full of what the townspeople of Maple Creek would probably call historic homes. They wouldn't even be considered that old where he was from. America was still such a young country. He pulled up to a neoclassical mansion with white pillars. Edward recognized it as the art museum from the pictures he'd seen on their website. He found a spot in the parking lot and stepped from his car. He walked toward the front entrance of the museum. A fountain sprinkled water in the front. He tried the doors, but they were locked. A sign posted by the front door said the museum opened at 10. He checked his watch. It was only 9.30. From what he understood, Mr. Dalton lived in a small cottage nestled in the trees behind the art museum. He walked around the side of the museum to see if he could find the house. All he could see was trees and bushes beyond the carefully landscaped garden that stood behind the museum. It took some investigating, but after a bit, he found a little trail leading through the woods. He followed it to a small ivy-covered stone home with a bright teal door. Stepping stones led up to the front porch. It was the only house he'd seen since coming to America that reminded him of something he'd find in back home. He walked across the trail of flat rocks that led to the front porch and knocked on the front door. A little cement rabbit sat on the front porch next to a wrought iron bench. Pots of flowers were clustered around the space, cheering it up with color. Edward suddenly felt nervous. So much was hanging on this moment. What if Mr. Dalton didn't want to accept him as a student? He couldn't go back to Mastonia. His father wanted him on the throne, but he had no interest in politics. His entire life had been about art. His parents had allowed him to get an art degree with the hopes that he'd get it out of his system and then prepare for his destiny ruling the country. But art school had only taught him to love the subject even further. He'd gone on to get his master's degree, and even that wasn't enough. He craved more. When he'd seen one of Richard Dalton's paintings at a local nobleman's home, he knew he wouldn't be able to rest until he'd had the opportunity to study under such a master. It had taken some digging, but he was able to find the contact info for Mr. Dalton. He'd tried reaching out with email first, but he hadn't gotten any response, not even when he tried multiple times. When the dynamic at home became too dangerous for him to stay, he decided to find Mr. Dalton in person. No one would think to come looking for him in Maple Creek. The door opened, and his eyes widened in surprise. The beautiful woman with the reddish-brown hair and the bright green eyes from the coffee shop looked up at him. She'd changed from the stained white button-down shirt into a charcoal gray blouse. He stared at her, speechless for a moment before regaining his composure. Oh, hello again, he said. Sorry about crashing into you earlier. Was this the woman named Carrington who Mrs. Wheaton had mentioned? Her brow furrowed. Are you following me? No. 
I, uh, came to see Richard Dalton. Is he home? She eyed him, suspiciously. Who's asking? He paused for a moment before speaking. Edward Brown. Is he expecting you? He shook his head. No. I tried contacting him, but I never heard back so I decided to stop by. He didn't bother adding that he'd come halfway across the world for his visit. He thought that might sound a bit stalkerish. And what were you contacting him about? She wasn't one to just let things go, was she? Couldn't she just go find him and let him talk to the man himself? I'm here to talk to him about his art. Sure, it wasn't the full story, but she didn't need to know everything, did she? I'm a big fan. Her face softened at that, and she pushed the door open wider. You can come in. I'll go get him. Are you Carrington? Her brow rose. How would you know that? A lady named Mrs. Wheaton told me you lived here with your father. A faint smile touched her perfectly pink lips. Mrs. Wheaton loves to talk. He smiled back at her. I noticed that right away. I bet you did. Her smile stretched wider. I'll be right back. My dad's in his studio. Edward had to fight to keep himself standing in place. He was eager to follow Carrington into her father's studio to see the master at work. He was actually at the house where the magic happened. It was unbelievable that Richard Dalton had been largely unknown for so many years. With his talent, he should be known worldwide. Edward was lucky that he'd come across his work. Lord Farley only had one of his paintings because he'd traveled to Virginia and had bought the artwork in a nearby gallery. Edward had spent most of his life studying the masters. He'd rarely seen such talent among contemporary artists. Richard Dalton's technique was unique, and Edward had fallen in love with it from the minute he'd first seen his work. He couldn't think of a more worthy artist to study under. He only hoped Mr. Dalton would give him a chance. As a crown prince, Edward was used to getting what he asked for. But he wasn't in in his country anymore, and no one here knew he was a prince. In Maple Creek he was the same as anyone else. It was a strange idea to him. He was so used to everyone around him bowing and scraping. There was something freeing about being stripped of his royal status. Not that he actually was, but as far as the citizens of this town knew, he was no one special. And most importantly, no one in town was trying to use his title to get ahead in the world. And no one wanted to take him down to take his place as heir. He just hoped it stayed that way. A man in his mid-fifties shuffled to the living room where Edward still stood. He had the same auburn hair as his daughter, graying at the temples. I'm Edward Brown. He stuck his hand out. Richard Dalton. The older man took his hand and shook it. That was hopeful. At least he wasn't running him off his property. Yet. I'm an admirer of your work. Edward looked down to where Mr. Dalton was releasing their handshake. His hands were speckled with paint. It made his heart happy to see. His own hands often looked the same way. That's what I hear. Do you paint yourself? Yes. That's actually what I wanted to see you about. Mr. Dalton raised his brows. Oh. Edward wrung his hands. I've gotten a master's in art, and I, uh, feel like my education is still lacking. Please don't say no. Mr. Dalton nodded. I can understand that feeling. We never really stop learning. I'd like to study under you, he blurted. He'd planned to lead into the conversation a bit smoother than that. He'd been trained his entire life to speak eloquently. But this situation called for something a bit more, direct. He needed to get his point across before this man threw him out of his house. He'd ignored his emails, so what would keep him from tossing him off his property as well? Mr. Dalton rubbed his chin. You'd like to study under me? 
Yes, sir. Well, I've only just met you. I'm not exactly telling you no, but I'd like to see a bit of your talent before I agree to something like that. His heart sped up. Mr. Dalton wasn't turning him down. Edward could work with this. That seems fair. How did you come to hear of me? You don't sound like you're from around here. I saw one of your paintings in a nobleman's home in Mastonia. Mastonia? Is that where you're from? Edward hesitated. He didn't want to start this apprenticeship off on the wrong foot by being dishonest. It was already bad enough that he'd given a false last name. But he couldn't risk having his identity known. Yes, sir. I'm from Mastonia. It's not every day that we get visitors from that part of the world. How did a nobleman from there end up with one of my paintings? He bought it from a gallery here in Virginia when he was visiting a few years ago. I see. I do have some work up for sale and some local galleries. How were you able to track the painting back to me? I contacted the gallery ere you sold the painting, and they provided me with your information. I'm impressed. You did your homework. Edward inclined his head. Thank you, sir. Hope soared in his chest. It wasn't solid yet, but he could see a future working with Richard Dalton. Chapter 2 Carrington retouched her lip gloss in the bathroom at the end of the hall and then slipped into her room to find her favorite pair of boots. The pair she'd been wearing earlier that day had coffee spilled on them. She could hear their visitor still talking to her dad. She'd been shocked when she'd opened her front door that morning to see the attractive guy from the coffee shop on her doorstep. One look, and he was sending her heart pounding. The guy obviously wasn't from anywhere nearby. He had a lush accent that reminded her of nobility and wealth. She could tell he was well-educated. And there was something about the way he held himself that shouted class. She sat on the edge of her bed and grabbed her boots. Carrington stuck her feet in them and zipped them up. Checking her reflection one last time, she then headed out to the living room. Edward was still talking to her dad. She grabbed a banana from the kitchen to eat a little later. I'm headed to the museum, dad. She looked over at Edward. It was nice meeting you. It was nice to meet you as well. He smiled back at her and reached out to shake her hand. She took his grasp, and electricity shot down her arm at his touch. She blinked. What was that? See you later. She headed out the door and crossed the front yard toward the employee entrance of the museum. She went inside and down the hall to her office. She set her purse and the banana on the desk. Her employee, Ellie, stepped into the doorway. She had her blonde hair piled up on top of her head in a messy bun. Bad news. The roof is leaking again. Some of the paintings got wet in the storm last night. Carrington groaned. She knew the patch job she'd had done last year wouldn't last forever, but she'd hoped they would have held up a bit longer. Could you tell if they were damaged? Ellie nodded. The paintings should be okay. Only a few drops got on the frames. But we might not be so lucky next time. I think we're going to have to replace the entire roof, Carrington said. That's going to be expensive. Carrington rubbed her forehead. Tell me about it. They'd had a roofer out there last year to fix the leaks, but he'd warned her the patches wouldn't hold up and would likely need the entire roof fixed within a year. They had a wedding next weekend. She couldn't have water dripping on the wedding guests. Why don't you show me where the leak is? Sure. She followed Ellie to the grand ballroom. The polished marble floors gleamed in contrast to the rich glossy wood of the walls and ceiling. Large windows let in plenty of natural light. They hosted weddings in both the gardens behind the museum and in the ballroom. It was where Carrington's best friend Soraya had gotten married recently. Ellie led her to the back wall. Sure enough, there was evidence of water damage next to a ladder Ellie must have used up to dry off the paintings. If you're all finished here, we should get this ladder put away so it's not in the way of today's visitors. 
I'll see if Ollie can help with that. Ellie rushed off toward the maintenance shed. Carrington inspected the rest of the museum for leaks and was relieved when she didn't find any. Guests milled about, staring up at the artwork. Several of her father's paintings hung throughout the museum. Carrington loved painting herself, but she was so busy with running the museum she didn't have much time for it anymore. She walked around the outside of the museum to check for any visible signs of damage on the roof. Edward crossed the grass toward her. Is everything all right? he asked when he was closer. She kept her gaze on the top of the building. The museum needs a new roof. Ah. I see. She looked over at him. How did it go with my dad? We're still talking through things. He wants to see some of my work. Do you have a portfolio for him? I have a website. I'm going to email him the link so he can look through it when he has a bit more time. I just hope he reads his email this time. Did you try to email him before? Yes. I never got a response. What email address did you send it to? I'm not sure. Let me check. He pulled out his phone and scrolled through, tapping on his screen. It was this one. He showed her the phone. Oh, yeah. That's an old one he doesn't check anymore. Did he give you updated information? He gave me a business card. Good. You should be fine then. She looked back to the museum and furrowed her brow. Where was she going to come up with the money she needed? What are you going to do about your roof problem? Edward asked. She shook her head. I have no idea. Shouldn't you just call someone to fix it? Oh, I could, but they usually want to be paid. And right now, I don't have the revenue to pay them. What about your fundraising campaigns? My dad isn't big on charity. Edward rose an eyebrow in surprise. How can you run a museum without fundraising? It's not very easy. We've been downward spiraling for a while, she admitted. Why was she telling all this to a complete stranger? I'm sorry. You don't need to hear about all our financial problems. Actually, I studied some of this at university. It's interesting to me. What's your degree in? Art history. I took some classes on museum management. A big part of running a museum is coming up with the funds to keep the doors open. I sat on the board, his voice trailed off. Um, it was interesting. Carrington scrunched her brow in confusion. What did you sit on? He'd been about to say something, but it was like he'd changed his mind about it. Oh, nothing. I was just saying that it was interesting learning about how to run a museum. I can't believe you learned about museum management too. We have that in common. I studied the same thing in school. What school did you go to? Oxford. He clamped his mouth shut like he hadn't meant to share that tidbit of information. Oxford. Wow. I'm impressed. You probably know more about this than I do. Edward ran his hand through his hair. Why did he look agitated? I don't know about that. You're the one with the hands-on experience. We are definitely not running this museum the way I was taught to run one. But my dad is the owner and calls all the shots. You can't convince him to change his mind? She shook her head. He spends most of his time painting. Running a non-profit isn't exactly at the top of his list of priorities. What are you going to do? I haven't decided yet. We can't let the artwork inside get damaged. Does your dad know about the roof issue? I haven't told him yet. She sighed. To be honest, I'm dreading it. Would you like me to talk to him? Edward offered. She shook her head. You just met him. Bringing something up like this to him could hurt your chances of working with him. Let me be the bearer of bad news. I can handle it. I just won't enjoy telling him. It's sweet of him to offer though. Edward nodded. If that's what you want. So, would you like to tour the museum? I'd love to. 
The front entrance is right around the corner. Would you like me to walk you over there? That would be nice. Thank you. They strolled toward the doors. Edward opened the door for Carrington, and they went inside. She waved at Ellie at the front desk. This is Edward. He's thinking about mentoring with my dad. Ellie grinned at him. Nice to meet you, Edward. Are you here to tour the museum? Yes, I am. He pulled out his wallet. How much for one ticket? Oh, no, Carrington said. I can let you in free. I insist, Edward said. Allow me to pay my own way. If that's what you want. Edward purchased his ticket, and then Carrington gave him a one-on-one -on -one personal tour of the museum. What a charming collection you have here, Edward said, gazing up at a landscape of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Do you paint? Carrington nodded. I do. My father taught me when I was young. I haven't had the chance to paint as much as I would like lately since I've been so busy running the museum. What are your favorite things to paint? Are you more interested in landscapes, portraits, still art? I love to paint faces, to capture the essence of a person in their expression. I enjoy that as well, Edward admitted. But landscapes are my favorite. That's where my dad shines as a painter. Yes, I know, Edward said. It's a big reason why I wanted to learn from him. There are plenty of beautiful landscapes around Maple Creek. The wooded hills are gorgeous, especially in the morning when there's a light mist covering them. I noticed that very thing on my drive in this morning, Edward said. I already have plans to paint those hills. I have several of my own paintings of the Blue Ridge Mountains hanging in my home. I'd love to see them. Sure. They walked through the museum, geeking out over the artwork. Carrington hadn't had that much fun talking about the art in a while. She'd been much too focused on the day-to-day -day operations of the museum. It was nice to walk through as a patron, something she hadn't taken the time to do in a long time. She'd gotten so caught up in the daily grind of finances that she'd forgotten to enjoy the sweetness of her love of art. It felt good to be reminded of why she'd chosen this career. Carrington got caught up in paperwork and didn't have a chance to talk to her dad about the leaky roof. When the museum closed for the day, she walked home. When she got inside, she called for her dad, but he was gone, probably running to the store for more paint. She fixed a simple dinner for herself of chicken and rice, with a green salad on the side. Her thoughts drifted to her earlier conversation with Edward outside the museum. It was sweet that he seemed to care so much about the museum. He seemed like a nice guy, but she wasn't looking to get involved with anyone. She'd spent a lot of years trying to impress a guy who never saw her. It was humiliating, so she never told anyone how she felt about Bryant. He'd placed her firmly in the friend zone, opting to seek after her friend Sully instead. It was useless, though, because Sully wasn't interested in him. She was tired of it. She'd moved on from her feelings for him. But the sting of rejection still lingered, and there was no way she wanted to get involved with someone else. She dug into her salad, and her phone buzzed on the table next to her. Aubrey, a bunch of us are going to Dixie's Tavern tonight. Want to come? Carrington, sure. After the day she'd had, an evening of pool and karaoke was exactly what she needed. She texted back and forth with Aubrey, setting up a time to meet. Aubrey Wheaton was a cute redhead who ran the Whitmore House, the museum's biggest competitor for weddings. Her mom was the biggest gossip in Maple Creek. It was just Edward's luck that he'd already had the dubious pleasure of running into her. Mrs. Wheaton was always trying to set her up with someone. Usually, her idea of who Carrington should be with was awful. But she'd been right about a few of her friends, so the lady wasn't completely horrible at her matchmaking skills. It was a wonder that Aubrey didn't have a boyfriend with a matchmaking mom always looking around. Carrington finished her dinner and then put her dishes in the dishwasher. After heading to her room to change for their outing, she opened her closet and dug through before settling on an orange flannel dress and tall brown boots. She put in chunky earrings and spritzed on some perfume. 
There were still 30 minutes until it was time to leave. Carrington flopped into a chair in the living room with a good romance novel. She allowed herself to get wrapped up in the story and let time pass. She was jarred by the buzzing of her phone. There was a new message. Aubrey, you coming? What time was it? Carrington checked her phone. She was 15 minutes late, so she closed her book and set it on the table next to the couch. She drove over to Dixie's tavern and went inside where she spotted Aubrey and Sully standing with Bryant by a pool table. Sully had her jet black hair long and loose around her shoulders. Of course, she looked gorgeous. And it hadn't escaped Bryant's notice, either. He was looking at her with obvious admiration and desire in his eyes. She'd already gotten past Bryant. It wasn't that hard, even. She deserved better. Why did she still care if he wanted Sully? It just bugged her that he'd never seemed to notice her. It didn't matter how much time she spent on her hair and makeup or how carefully she picked out her clothes. All he could see was Sully. She pasted a bright smile on her face. Hey, guys. Look who decided to show up, Bryant teased. He kept his dark hair cut short and his shirt was tied across his gym-toned body. Her heart pounded when he smiled at her like that. She couldn't help it. It was years of habit. It was stupid, and she knew it. Could she be any more of a loser when it came to relationships? Come play with us. Aubrey handed her a pool stick. You can be on my team. Sure about that. Carrington joked. You know I'm horrible at this game. Aubrey shrugged. It's just for fun, right? Don't say that too loud, Bryant said. Sully might hear you. You know how competitive she gets. I'm standing right here, Sully said, punching his arm. Carrington frowned. Sully really should be more careful about flirting with Bryant. He might get the wrong idea. Sure enough, he got a hopeful, dopey grin on his face. It was Carrington's turn, and she bent over to shoot. Mind if I join in the next round? She'd know that accent anywhere. Carrington made her shot and then turned to see Edward standing beside her. He had on a black collared shirt with the sleeves rolled up to his elbows, and he looked absolutely breathtakingly handsome. She felt her face flush, just looking at him. She knew she was openly staring, but she couldn't help it. Hey, guys. This is Edward. Aubrey's face lit up. Oh, Edward. My mom was telling me about you. You're new in town, right? Edward looked confused. Your mother knows me? Mrs. Wheaton. She said you met at Josie's, Aubrey said. Recognition flashed across his face. Oh, yes. She's your mother? Yep. She's quite the, interesting lady. Let me guess, she tried to set you up with someone when she found out you were single? Aubrey said. Does she do that a lot? Constantly, Sully said. I think she's tried to set me up with half the single population of Maple Creek. Edward laughed, a musical sound Carrington could get used to. Oh no. She didn't want to fall for him. The last thing she needed was a new guy to put her in the friend zone. She'd worked so hard to get Bryant out of her head. Although, Bryant wasn't aware of her longtime crush. She'd never let him know because he'd been so open about his feelings for Sully. Anyway, he'd been clear that he only saw her as a friend. Sully and Bryant won their pool game, and Aubrey let Edward take her place, opting to get a drink from the bar instead. You any good at playing pool? Bryant asked Edward. Was it just Carrington's imagination, or did Bryant seem jealous of Edward? There was something about the way he was holding his body around Edward, like he was puffing out his chest a bit more than before. Edward shrugged. I'm not bad. He turned to Carrington and leaned in close so he was speaking into her ear with that delicious accent of his. The plan is to crush them. Goosebumps chased down her spine, and she couldn't help but grin at him. Deal. He maneuvered past her, 
his arm brushing against hers as he positioned himself to hit the ball. She admired his arms and broad shoulders as he leaned across the table. She felt someone's gaze on her and looked up. Sully was watching her from across the table with a small smile. Had she caught her checking out Edward? Great. Just what she needed. Someone witnessing her drooling over a guy who probably wanted nothing to do with her. Edward made his shot and got three balls in. Nice. Bryant bristled. Not bad. But we can do better. Edward looked over at him. You're quite welcome to try. Bryant smirked at him. Prepare to be slaughtered. Edward shot another two balls into pockets. It certainly doesn't look like you're getting a good head start on that. Bryant frowned. He didn't have much to worry about. Carrington wasn't very good at the game. It wasn't like she'd be doing any slaughtering. She'd leave that up to Edward. He was doing just fine all on his own. And being around him was doing funny things to her heart. Chapter 3 Edward didn't like Bryant. He was cocky and full of himself. Edward shot the last ball into a side pocket, winning the game. He couldn't help the self-satisfied grin that spread across his face. Maybe that would put the guy in his place. Carrington squealed and threw her arms around Edward. We did it. We won. He grinned. He wasn't expecting to have a beautiful woman hug him, but he couldn't say he minded. Oh, sorry. She stepped away from him, her face red, removing her arms from his shoulders. Sometimes I get overly excited about things. No need to apologize, he said. I'm not going to complain if you want to hug me. Anyone want to play again? Sully asked. No, thank you, Edward said. I think I'm going to get a drink. I'll play, Bryant said. I'm getting a drink, too, Carrington said, following Edward to the bar. He took a seat, and she grabbed the stool next to him. The bartender was an older woman. She approached them with a towel thrown over her shoulder. Dixie, can I get another margarita, extra salt? Carrington asked. Sure, honey, Dixie said. She looked at Edward. What can I get you, handsome? Bourbon. Neat, please. He turned to Carrington. How long have you known Bryant? She glanced at him with a strange expression on her face. Had he said the wrong thing? For some reason, his question seemed to make her uncomfortable, and it made him wonder if there was a history there. Since high school. Sully too. Everyone seems to know each other here. We basically do. We don't get many people moving in and out of Maple Creek. Most of us who grew up here end up staying. We have had a few people who've gone off to bigger and better things. But they usually come back to visit. It seems like a nice place. It's a wonderful place to live. I've known nothing different though. She took her drink from Dixie. Do you ever feel like seeing what else the world has to offer? I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Dixie set a glass on the bar and poured bourbon into it. Thanks. Carrington took a sip of her drink. Oh, this is perfect. Thank you, Dixie. Dixie winked at her. No problem, sweetie. He picked up the glass and swirled the liquid in the bottom. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? Egypt, maybe. I'd love to see the pyramids. Either that or Paris. She looked over at him. What about you? Ever been to either of those places? I've never been to Egypt, but I've been to Paris many times. Carrington widened her eyes. Many times? That's impressive. And lucky. Edward groaned inwardly. He probably shouldn't have let it slip that he'd been to Paris more than once. The average person probably wouldn't have been able to travel that much. 
he didn't want her to get too curious about his past. It wasn't safe for her. Well, I was an art student. It was part of our education to see Paris. I was an art student too. We had trips to Europe available to us, but I never could afford it. Edward opened his mouth and then closed it. The less he said on the subject, the better. I'd love to see the Louvre. She got a dreamy look in her eye. I've imagined many times what it would be like to visit. It's spectacular. One of my favorite places in the world. Seeing the look on her face made him wish she could experience it one day for herself. He took a sip of the bourbon. What are your other favorites? Carrington asked. Places to visit? Edward thought about it for a moment. Japan. I've painted the cherry blossoms in the spring. It was magical. That sounds amazing. Do you like the food there? Some of the tastiest food came from street vendors. The most interesting, too. Carrington looked at him, her eyes sparkling. It sounds like quite the adventure. It's been a few years since I've been there. Is this your first time in America? Carrington sipped her margarita. It is, he admitted. Is it obvious? Not really. I couldn't tell. You seem to know your way around. Your country is more casual than what I'm used to. Mastonians are a lot more, he searched for the right word. Formal. He tipped his head back, finishing the rest of his bourbon. He waved Dixie over. May I get another one, please? Formal? Carrington asked. Yes. We have certain social expectations. It's more rigid. In what way? Carrington played with the bottom of a strand of her auburn hair. It was distracting. In a good way. Watching her toy with her hair made him wonder what it felt like. Would it be silky beneath his fingertips? Etiquette, for instance. And we tend to be more reserved compared to Americans. That sounds intimidating. She didn't know the half of it. Especially at the palace. Those expectations were even higher. But he didn't mention that. He didn't want her to know his involvement with the palace. It would raise too many questions. You get used to it. Especially after years of training. He'd spent a good bit of his youth learning to have the best manners in the country. What's the food like in Mastonia? I have to admit, I don't know a thing about the country. For the most part, it's simple. We eat a lot of roasted foods like chicken and beef, but we always eat potatoes with it. And we eat potatoes in every form you can imagine. Mashed, fried, hashed, baked, boiled. Coffee is a staple there too. The winters are pretty harsh, so coffee and strong tea gets us through it. Do you like traditional Mastonian food, or would you rather have food from another country? Carrington asked. I enjoy spicier foods, like what you might find in India or Asia. I'm the same way. But for me, I mostly like spicy foods from Mexico. I'm not a big, curry eater. Edward rose a brow at her and leaned forward. Maybe you haven't experienced the right curries. Her bottom lip dropped slightly, like she was mesmerized by what he was saying. Or maybe it was just him. Did he have an effect on her? It felt like there was something else going on between them, beyond just a conversation about food. A spark of chemistry. She blinked twice, like she was clearing her head. Maple Creek isn't the best place to experience exotic cuisine. Then maybe you ought to consider traveling abroad to widen your horizons. Maybe I should. She twisted her glass in front of her and wiped at the condensation on the side. Only, traveling takes money, and right now, I'm tight on funds. My main concern is getting that roof fixed. Were you able to speak with your father about fundraising? Carrington's mouth turned downward. No. By the time I got home from work, 
he'd already left the house. I haven't seen him since this morning. I'm sure you'll see him later at home. Well yeah, I live with the guy. I'm just not looking forward to the conversation because I know he's going to be stubborn about it. I'm going to have to really stand up to him to get him to listen. Edward didn't want to say much more. The issue was between Carrington and her father. He had his own dilemma to worry about. He needed to convince her father to take him on as an apprentice. Carrington made a face. I hate conflict. But that's enough about me. Tell me what you did today. After touring the museum, I went to my Airbnb to get settled in. It was a small basement apartment. He wasn't used to such humble lodgings, but he didn't want to attract attention by staying in someplace more expensive. He was supposed to look like a starving artist. But, he supposed it was comfortable enough, and there was a strong Wi-Fi signal. I was able to email your father at the new address listed on the business card. I sent him a link to my website. Has he responded to you? No, I still have heard nothing back. He'd spent the afternoon unpacking and checking and double-checking his email to see if he'd gotten a response from Mr. Dalton. Edward finally gave up and went to dinner. He'd felt jumpy, worried that someone might locate his position in Maple Creek, but so far, no one had seemed to know where he was. Even now, he checked the corners of the tavern for anyone who might look shady. How did you end up at Dixie's? Well, it was a nice evening, so I walked to a nearby restaurant. On my way out, I passed Dixie's tavern and decided to see what Maple Creek's nightlife was like. And how do you like it? He smiled at her. So far, I haven't been disappointed. The competition at the pool table had been enjoyable, and the best part was that Carrington was there. He'd been taken with her since he'd bumped into her in the coffee shop this morning. He'd been in some of the poshest clubs in Europe, but there was something endearing about the small tavern. Even back home, he liked to go to the bars where the locals hung out. He may be a prince, but he felt more at ease around the average citizen. It was refreshing to be in Maple Creek, where no one knew he was royalty. Back home when he'd go into a bar, everyone knew who he was. But here, he could be himself without worrying if someone was treating him differently because he was a prince. Hey! You want to sing some karaoke? Carrington asked, pulling him from his thoughts. I'd love to. He'd been vocally trained since he was a young boy. He enjoyed singing karaoke in the local bars back in Mastonia. I'll go pick us a song. She hopped off her bar stool and grabbed her drink. She walked over to the DJ stand, hips swaying. That woman was going to be the death of him. She spoke to the DJ for a moment and then returned with a smile on her face. That was when he saw her adorable dimples. He hadn't noticed them before. What song did you choose? He hoped it was something he knew. She'd left so quickly he hadn't had a chance to talk it over with her. Shallow. You know, the song Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper sing in A Star Is Born? Yes. It's a good song. At least he knew the song and wouldn't make a fool of himself. Good. Because we're up next. She took a long drink from her margarita and then set it on the bar. She reached out and grabbed his hand. Her skin was warm and soft against his. Come on. Let's go wait for our turn. He followed her, not knowing what else to do. They stood for a moment before their song came up. They took the stage, and each grabbed a microphone. The introduction played, and he started singing. She looked over at him and rose her eyebrows like she was impressed. He may not be good at everything he attempted to do, but he could sing. And apparently, so could she. When it was her turn to sing, her voice was throaty and deep, but achingly beautiful. He could stand there and listen to her all night. She got to the chorus and belted it out, causing goosebumps to raise on his arms. He joined in with her and their voices blended magically. 
When he looked over at her, she met his eye. He couldn't help the smile that crept over his face. Singing with her left him with a high he could live off for days. When they left the stage, he felt like he was floating. She went back to the bar and grabbed her drink again, looking at him with admiration in her eyes. Not bad, Edward. Who knew you had a set of pipes on you? What else are you hiding? He coughed. Um, nothing that exciting. Only the fact that he was the crown prince of Mastonia. That wasn't that big of a secret, was it? He was starting to like this girl. Eventually, she would discover his identity. He just hoped she didn't hate him when that moment came. Chapter 4 Edward came over early that morning to meet with Carrington's father. She was in the kitchen, eating a bowl of oatmeal, when he knocked on the front door. She was glad she'd already gotten ready for the day. Getting caught with her hair wet or without makeup wouldn't have been ideal. Hanging out with Edward the night before had been fun. Maybe a little too much fun. She probably should have stuck to only one margarita. Had she made a fool of herself? Edward hadn't seemed to mind, though. She was starting to crush on him. But that worried her. She didn't want to get hung up on another guy. There was a museum with a leaky roof to worry about. She got the door. Edward stood there with his hair styled and a crisp blue button-down shirt and khaki pants that looked like they came from a ritzy designer. Again, he was the embodiment of class. He wasn't what she expected when she thought of an artist. Usually, an artsy guy dressed a bit more, creatively. Edward looked like he was ready to walk into a business meeting. Maybe that was what this was to him. He was trying to impress her dad, after all. Come on in. She swung open the door wider for him, so he could pass through. He even smelled good, like an ultra-expensive cologne. How did a guy who painted for a living afford such nice clothes and cologne? Not to mention all that traveling. It was possible that he'd made good money with his work, but that was the exception, not the rule. There was a reason people used the term, starving artist. Maybe his parents had money, and he had a trust fund. He did go to a school outside of his home country, but she didn't think it would be polite to ask him if his parents were loaded. You look nice, he said. Oh, thanks. She felt a flush creeping across her face. He was probably just being polite. She had on a black and white polka dotted blouse and a black pencil skirt. She'd pulled her auburn hair back into a chic messy bun with a few tendrils of wavy hair loose around her face. She felt pretty and knew she looked good today. But that didn't mean Edward was interested. She cleared her throat and stiffened her back. You look nice today too. Very, um, professional. Pardon me, but is your father at home? Edward tucked his hands in his pockets, looking all official. I'd quite like to speak with him. Carrington held back a giggle. Edward spoke so formally. Is something funny? She covered a hand over her mouth and forced a cough. No. Nothing's funny. I'll go let my dad know you're here. She went back to where her dad's studio was set up. He'd been up for hours. He liked to paint in the early morning light. He said it inspired him. His back was to her, and he was working on a still life of a vase of daisies. Edward's here to see you. Did you have time to look over his work? Her dad turned around to look at her over his glasses. I did. I looked at it last night while you were out. She lowered her voice. What do you think? He took off his glasses and folded them before putting them in his pocket. He has a rare talent. Carrington hadn't seen any of his artwork, but now she was intrigued. So does that mean you're taking him on? He stood up. Maybe I should talk to him. That was fair. He could probably hear what they were saying. She followed him out to the living room, where Edward was seated on the edge of the seat of an armchair, like he was ready to spring off it at any moment. As soon as they came into the room, he stood. Mr. Dalton, I. Please, call me Richard. 
Richard. He wrung his hands, and then, like he'd just realized he was fidgeting, he dropped them to his sides. I assume you were able to peruse my website. Yes. Please have a seat. He motioned to the couch. Edward followed his direction and sat on the sofa. Her dad sat across from him in the armchair. Carrington didn't want to hover, so she went into the kitchen to grab some coffee. She needed to head to the museum soon. Voices drifted in from the living room. They were discussing Edward's education at Oxford and his goals for the future. The dripping of the coffee drowned out most of what they were saying, but she still caught bits and pieces of their conversation. It sounded like it was going well. Obviously, her dad was impressed with his level of talent, but did that mean he wanted to take Edward on as an apprentice? It was an enormous time commitment. Carrington still hadn't talked to her dad about starting a fundraiser for the roof. He'd already gone to bed by the time she'd gotten home the night before. After adding cream and sugar to her coffee, she snapped on a lid. She planned to take it to the museum with her so she could sip on it all morning. Heading back to her room, she went to grab her purse and laptop bag. She caught something Edward was saying as she walked past. I look forward to working with you, Richard. I quite appreciate the offer. So her dad had said yes. That meant she'd be seeing a lot more of Edward. How could she concentrate on anything with such an attractive male around all the time? She couldn't let him become a distraction. She'd learned her lesson about obsessing over a guy who wasn't interested. And why would Edward be interested in her? He'd been friendly toward her, sure. But that didn't mean he wanted to be with her. For whatever reason, guys didn't seem to see her as more than a friend. It hadn't been all bad, being single all these years. Carrington had gone to school, gotten a degree, and worked hard to run a museum. She was living her dream and didn't need a guy to be happy. But something seemed to be missing. There had to be more than this existence of being alone. She'd watched most of her friends get married off. They'd each been so blissfully happy. Would that day ever come for her? She'd just about given up on that dream. She grabbed her purse and laptop bag and re-emerged from her room. Edward and her dad were shaking hands. I'd like to start with some landscape scenes. There's a pleasant park nearby with beautiful views of the Blue Ridge Mountains. How about we head over there in a couple of hours from now and set up some easels? I can bring you guys a picnic, Carrington offered, coming into the room. Her dad looked over at her from where he was sitting in the armchair. That would be nice, Carrington. It's lovely of you to offer, Edward said. She shouldered her laptop bag. I'll just take a lunch break from work. They arranged a location at the park and a specific time to meet. Sounds good. I need to get to work. Congrats on your new apprenticeship, Edward. She would see him around more often now, whether she liked it or not. Carrington headed home from the museum and put together some sandwiches, baby carrots and ranch, chips, and fresh berries. She filled a large container with lemonade and then packed the food into a picnic basket that had cups and plates secured in the lid. Tucking a blanket under her arm, she carried the supplies to the car. She'd changed into jeans and boots because sitting outside on the ground in a pencil skirt wasn't practical or comfortable. She drove to the park, passing trees with their leaves turning yellow and red. Carrington pulled into a spot near a sprawling ancient oak tree and looked up to see the gorgeous branches stretching overhead. A few yards away, her dad and Edward worked together with their easel set up. They seemed to be deep in conversation. She trudged through the grass with her arms laden with picnic supplies. They still hadn't seemed to notice her. Hey, she called out to them as she drew near. Edward and her dad turned to look at her just as she tripped over a tree root and stumbled. She fought to regain her balance, but she fell forward anyway. She slammed into the easels with her arms full of the blanket and basket. Paint flew up and splattered all over her. The easels fell to the ground. She landed sideways with her cheek pressed into the grass. She released her hold on the blanket and basket and pushed up. Carrington, her dad called out to her. Are you all right? 
Edward offered her his hand. I didn't notice you at first. She took his hand and allowed him to help her to her feet. Story of my life. Men don't notice me. We didn't even see you coming, her dad said. Not until you tripped and fell. Oh, it's okay. She felt her hair falling down. Her bun was probably skewed to the side. She wiped the loose hairs back from her face. Something cold oozed against her chest. She looked down to see green paint splattered across her favorite blouse and groaned. Edward grabbed a stack of napkins and offered them to Carrington. Thank you. She dabbed at her shirt, but it was useless. There wasn't a way she'd be able to salvage the top. You have a blade of grass stuck to your cheek, Edward pointed out. He reached out and brushed it off her cheek. Oh. She felt her face flush at his touch. She must have looked so clumsy, flailing all over the place. Her dad grabbed the easel she'd knocked into and set it back up. The painting he'd started hadn't gotten a speck of paint on it from the accident. How had she been able to manage that? Thankfully, she hadn't gotten any paint on her jeans either. I have a spare shirt in my car. I'll just grab it and change in the bathroom. There was a porta potty set up on the other side of the parking lot. We'll get the picnic set up while you're changing, her dad said. Thanks, dad. She went back to her car and rummaged through the back set until she found a t-shirt that she'd had since high school. It was her nerdy band shirt. It was faded and had a hole in the armpit, but it would have to do. She went to the porta potty and stepped inside. She took off her paint covered shirt and rolled it up, setting it on the edge of the toilet seat. It was disgusting, but she didn't have anywhere else to put it other than the gross floor, which was worse. She could have pinned it between her knees, but she didn't want the paint to seep into her jeans. She pulled the other shirt over her head. It smelled like years of old sweat. She'd mostly used it to go running in, and the stench had embedded into the fabric. It hadn't been washed since the last time she'd been running in it. She pulled it down around her waist and turned to get her blouse. As she twisted, she knocked the shirt into the toilet. She yelped and gaped at it floating down in the pit of blue liquid below. There was no way she was going after it. Now there was definitely no salvaging the blouse. She used some of the hand sanitizer because just being in there made her feel germy. Then she stepped out in her stinky old band t-shirt. So much for looking cute at the picnic. She just hoped Edward didn't get too close to her. She walked over to them. Her dad and Edward had done a great job of spreading out their picnic foods and lemonade. She smiled down at them. Thanks, guys. No, we should thank you for the food, Edward said. She plopped down on the blanket next to Edward. It was the only spot available. She just hoped he didn't get a whiff of her stinky t-shirt. Carrington makes a delicious turkey sandwich. Her dad passed a sandwich to Edward. I'm starving. He took the sandwich out of the plastic bag and bit into it. He chewed and swallowed. This is excellent. Carrington couldn't help but smile. The secret is the bread. I buy it from my friend Alexis's bakery. It's a lot more expensive than shopping at the grocery store, but it's totally worth it. I'll have to go to this bakery to see what else they have. Alexis makes the best cupcakes. Well, it's her recipes. She doesn't actually work there anymore. She married Owen Hadley and moved to Hollywood to set up another bakery. Edward's brow rose. Owen Hadley? Like the actor? That's him. He went to high school with us. Edward's mouth fell open and his eyes lit up. I love his movies. I can't believe you know him. Do you think you can introduce him to me sometime? Sure. I'll give Alexis a call and find out when they plan on coming back for a visit. They're expecting a baby in a few months, so I'm not sure how much longer she'll be traveling. But they come back to town from time to time to check in on her bakery. Her brother Chase lives in Maple Creek too, so she comes to see him and his family. Edward leaned forward to reach into the picnic basket 
and Carrington sat back away from him. She didn't want him getting too close and smelling her gross shirt. Why didn't she at least have a bottle of body spray in her car for emergencies like this? Even scented lotion would have been better than nothing. If Edward noticed she smelled bad, he said nothing. Always the gentleman, he stayed polite and pleasant. He always seemed to know the right thing to say and was so well-spoken. She felt like a clumsy fool next to him. Today, it had been glaringly obvious. And she couldn't help but blush when he paid her any attention. She had to get better control of her emotions. She'd been able to hide her crush on Bryant for years. Surely, she could hide these new feelings she was experiencing. She just hoped she wouldn't end up getting hurt again. Chapter 5 Dad, I've been meaning to talk to you, Carrington said. She had a nervousness in her voice that was hard to miss. Was she about to ask her father about the fundraiser? What's on your mind? The roof is leaking on the museum. Get Don out here to patch it up again, he said dismissively, like he just wanted the problem to vanish into thin air. Edward held back a groan of frustration. Didn't her father understand how serious it was to have a leaky roof with all that artwork inside? We did that a year ago. Carrington had so much patience in her voice. Edward would have been a lot more annoyed with the man. He warned us then that we'd need to replace the entire roof. The storm we had the other day was too much for the patch job he did. Well, there's no money for a new roof, so we'll just have to make do, he said in a matter-of-fact tone, wiping his hands off on a napkin. We need to raise the money. Carrington's voice was firm. Her dad scoffed. We will not beg for money. That's part of running a museum. We have to hold fundraisers, Carrington explained. She's right. Edward nodded. You can't properly run a museum without doing at least a small amount of fundraising. Richard turned to him. Oh, is that so? Do you have a lot of fundraising experience? He didn't want to say too much. He'd had plenty of experience running a museum as a member of the board of the National Art Museum in Mastonia. They'd held regular fundraisers, including a dinner every year at Christmastime that brought in the bulk of the money. I studied museum management in art school at Oxford, and I helped with the National Museum of Art in Mastonia. If you don't run a fundraiser to gain enough money for a new roof, you'll end up with even more damage. Eventually, you'll have to close your doors. I know nothing about running a fundraiser, Richard complained. Please, Dad. It's not taking charity. It's a normal part of running a museum. I learned about it at school too. I'm a painter who is clueless about the business side of things. You won't have to do anything, Carrington promised. I'd take over all of it, but I'd still need you to approve it. I'm willing to help too, Edward volunteered. Richard grunted. It sounds like I've been outnumbered. Does that mean you're saying yes? Carrington squealed. Yes, but I don't like it, he said begrudgingly. This is great news. Carrington squealed. Don't go too crazy, he grumbled. Or I might change my mind. Carrington stood up and brushed a few crumbs off her hands. Even in the ratty t-shirt she wore and her hair sitting on her head lopsided, she looked beautiful. He couldn't resist the adorable scattering of freckles she had across her nose. I need to get back to work. We'll help you pack up, Edward offered. Normally, he'd have a team of servants around to clean up a picnic, but that wasn't the case in Virginia. If he wanted to avoid suspicion and keep from looking like an entitled jerk, he had to pitch in. Once the food and picnic supplies were packed up in Carrington's car, she left. Edward turned back to his painting, and his lesson resumed. He'd spent the morning eagerly absorbing everything Richard had to say. He felt like he'd just been handed a gold mine filled with possibility. He had a feeling his potential as an artist had just skyrocketed. 
They spent the rest of the afternoon painting, with Richard offering instruction. When the sun dipped low on the horizon, they packed up. His head was filled with so much inspiration, it was overwhelming. It was the start of an amazing opportunity. He just wasn't sure how long it would last. He still had the throne to think about. His younger brother, Ramsay, had been disgusted by his lack of dedication to ruling since they were young boys. Ramsay believed ruling came before all else. He'd been the black sheep of the family, heavily drinking, gambling, and repeatedly embarrassing the royal family with his escapades. Then the assassins Ramsay had hired had forced Edward to leave the country and go into hiding for his own safety. No one knew where he was. Not even his parents. They knew only that he was going into hiding. His father had his security force searching for the traitors, but so far, they'd been evading the authorities. Edward planned to stay in hiding until the criminals were imprisoned. Edward carried his art supplies to his car and said goodbye to Richard. He drove toward his apartment, but then Carrington's worried face popped into his head and he turned at the last minute to the museum. Edward had a few ideas about what Carrington could do to raise money for the new roof. He pulled into the museum parking lot and walked inside. At the front desk, he asked for Carrington, and Ellie led him to the back offices. Carrington? She looked up from her desk. She'd changed into a bright purple blouse, and her hair was back into the loose bun. He couldn't see any trace of the paint accident that had happened earlier that day. Oh, hi, Ellie. Edward's here to see you. He stepped in the doorway, and Ellie left. Hi, Edward. Carrington stood up. What can I do for you? She walked around her desk toward him. A pleasant floral scent wafted off her. Have you put any thought into what you can do to raise money for the museum? I've been putting together some plans. What do you have so far? He took a seat in one of the chairs across from her desk. I, uh. I have it under control. As much as I appreciate your offer for help, I'm sure you have your hands full with your painting. I wouldn't want to burden you with trying to solve my problems. I'm all done with my painting for the day. And it's no problem. I'm happy to help. Well, like I said, it's all being taken care of. I think you could use some assistance. You're new to fundraising, and I have experience with a museum that's had a lot of success with it. I'm willing to give you a hand. I'd like to. She sighed and sat at her desk. Fine. What did you have in mind? Have you thought about having a gala? The museum in Mastonia does a big dinner every year at Christmas, and it's been quite successful. I noticed that you have a lovely ballroom where you could hold a gala. I was thinking about holding a race. Edward threw his hands up in the air and smiled. Do both. That might be pushing it with my dad. What do you have to lose? Right now, you can't continue on without more funds. I know you're right, but I feel so overwhelmed with all of this. That's why you need my help. I'm going to be around anyway, studying with your father. It won't be any sacrifice for me at all. And it would give him a good excuse to spend more time with Carrington. He wasn't looking for anything romantic, but she was certainly nice to look at and she shared his love of art. He'd really enjoyed spending time with her. Well, let's hear what else you have. She leaned back in her chair and steepled her fingers. I was looking at your website yesterday, and I noticed you don't have a place there where people can donate to the museum. That's a large oversight that's easily remedied. I couldn't see any evidence of a membership program either. Those are two simple ways that museums make money without holding fundraisers. We could set up a membership program. It wouldn't be that hard to do, Carrington agreed. And the button does sound like an easy fix. You can have t-shirts made with the museum logo. Sell them in a little gift shop. Carrington had a thoughtful look on her face. 
We've thought about putting in a gift shop in the past. It's just never slowed down enough to get to. It sounds like you have a lot of missed opportunities for growth. Ticket sales and random donations from community members have always been enough in the past. Well, that and the weddings we hold here. That's brought in enough to keep us afloat. But think what you could do with a bigger or more prestigious collection. Edward could feel the excitement creeping into his voice. He loved a good fixer-upper. This museum had so much untapped potential for growth. Carrington seemed to catch on to the excitement he was feeling. I have been wanting to add more artwork to our collection. Maybe with a membership program, we could expand. That's the spirit. Carrington looked thoughtful for a moment. She swept a strand of hair back from her cheek. I do have a lot of friends with money who might be interested in attending a gala at the museum. In Maple Creek? It seemed like such a humble place. You'd be surprised. There are quite a few famous people from this town. Ever heard of Chase Remington? Of course. Who hasn't heard of the lead singer of Remington Sound? Unless you're living under a rock. Even in Mastonia we listen to his music. He lives here in town. I went to high school with him and his wife, Lauren. She owns a cute little salon in town called All Dolled Up. It was her dream to run the salon, so when Chase fell in love with her, he moved back into town to help her dream come true. Wait. I met her my first day here at the coffee shop. She's married to Chase Remington? Yep. And then there's your friend with the bakery who married the movie star, Owen Hadley. Yes. That's Chase's sister. They'd come to the gala to support the museum, too. I guarantee it. Not to mention Kane and Benson. Who are they? Kane went to school with us and just got married here at the art museum to my best friend, Soraya. I think he might be a billionaire now. Benson is the quarterback for the New York Giants football team. She knew almost as many famous people as he did, and he was a member of a royal family. He'd met a lot more famous people, but he wasn't on a first-name basis like Carrington seemed to be with these people from her hometown. That's a great start if you're going to have a gala. There are plenty of small business owners in Maple Creek who would probably donate to the museum, too. This town is great about pulling together to help one of their own who is struggling. Edward loved that. It made him want to stick around and see who all these amazing people were. He wished he could see more of a sense of community in his own country. So many people were wrapped up in their own lives. Carrington pulled out a pad of paper and started jotting down notes. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. These are all such great ideas. He was glad she liked his suggestions, even if she hadn't wanted to listen to him at first. Are you still planning to hold a race? I was thinking we could have a 5K for the museum mid-November. Do you think that would give us enough time to spread the word and get everything set up? That's six weeks away. He considered the time frame for a moment. I don't see why not. When would you want to do the gala? In December. So we can send invites. We're already set up to do weddings, and this won't be that much different. That sounds great. He suddenly felt hungry. When you're finished up here, would you like to get something to eat? Oh, um. Carrington's cheeks went rosy. Okay. That would be great. She straightened some papers on her desk and then stood up. I'm pretty much finished for the day. Do you want to go now? I'd love to. Where did you want to eat? You're the one who knows the town. Where do you recommend? Edward asked. Hadley's. It's one of the best restaurants in Maple Creek. What kind of food is it? Farm fresh local food. Home cooked foods you'd eat at someone's home here in Maple Creek, but the best quality you could imagine. Owen Hadley started the restaurant. 
really? Now Edward was intrigued. That's quite interesting. I'd love to try it. Carrington grabbed her coat from the back of her desk chair and struggled to put it on. Here. Allow me to help you with your coat. He stepped close to her and held the coat so she could slip her other arm inside the sleeve. This close, he noticed her floral perfume again. She smelled divine. We can take my car, he offered when she had her coat on. Okay. They walked together toward the exit. When they passed the front entrance, Ellie gave a questioning look at Carrington. He smiled and waved at her. She lifted a hand hesitantly back at him. He chuckled to himself. Carrington's employee looked like she wanted to grill her boss about why she was leaving with him. He led her to his rental car and opened her door for her. Thank you, she said. He looked up Hadley's in his phone and pulled the directions up on his GPS. You could have just asked me how to get there, Carrington pointed out. Yes, but this is just as easy, and we can talk without thinking about where to go next. Carrington shrugged. I guess that's true. Your town is so quaint, Edward said as they drove past rows of older homes. I do love it. The people are so friendly. It seems like such a wonderful place. Carrington smiled at him. I'm glad you like it here. Before long, they were pulling up to the restaurant. I'm eager to have a classic Maple Creek experience. I've only been here for a few days, but it's already beginning to find a place in my heart. Carrington grinned. This town has a way of doing that. It pulls you in. Just like the woman by his side. She'd begun to pull him in, and he wasn't sure how he felt about that. He wasn't looking to get involved with another woman after his experience with Elizabeth. He'd been hurt too much. She'd betrayed him horribly, and he wasn't sure he could trust again. Chapter 6 It was fun to introduce someone to Hadley's who hadn't been there before. Carrington loved to see Maple Creek through Edward's eyes. He'd found joy in simple things she'd taken for granted for years, like Dixie's Tavern. Being around him made her appreciate her hometown more. They walked into the restaurant together. I'm interested to see how you like the food here, Carrington said. A hostess with a blonde ponytail greeted them. Welcome to Hadley's. How many do you have in your party today? Just the two of us, Edward said. The hostess glanced down at the chart on the podium before looking back up at them. Okay, right this way. Light brown wooden tables lined the room with potted plants overhead. The restaurant had a fresh, clean, modern vibe to it. She led them toward a small table, and they took a seat on opposite sides. Your server should be with you soon. She placed menus in front of them. Edward pulled her chair out for her. The best part of this restaurant is the bread. Carrington took a seat and unrolled her silverware and placed the napkin in her lap. She arranged her fork and knife neatly in front of her. I can hardly wait to try it, Edward said. I'd love to go to Paris to try their bakeries. If you ever decide to go, let me know. I can recommend some of my favorite places. Carrington giggled. I'll be sure to do that. She liked it that Edward was talking about their distant future like they'd still be in contact. Unless you decide to go back to Mastonia and forget all about me. I won't forget you, he promised. How could I forget Richard Dalton's beautiful daughter? Carrington couldn't help the blush that flooded her cheeks. You think I'm beautiful? I have eyes, don't I? She smiled at him. That's really nice of you. One side of Edward's mouth turned upward. I'm just stating the facts. Carrington's heart pounded. How could she help it with a guy like this in front of her? He was gorgeous and charming. And now he was flirting with her. At least, she thought he was. She didn't want to read anything into his flirtatious remarks. Lots of guys spouted pretty words but didn't mean anything by it. A young girl with dark hair came to their table. 
Hey. I'm Jessie. I'll be your server tonight. What can I get you started with to drink? I'll have a Chardonnay, Carrington said. A water too, please. Edward smiled up at the server. I'll have the same. The server left, and Edward looked down at the menu. What's good here? I'm planning to get the roasted chicken. That sounds like something we'd eat in Macedonia. You could try the chicken and dumplings. It's always delicious. He read over the menu some more. I'll take your word for it. He closed the menu. So did Owen Hadley come up with these recipes himself? I believe he did. He told me he grew up cooking with his mom and always wanted to open a restaurant one day. So both he and his wife have businesses in Maple Creek that they're running long distance. Carrington closed her menu. Yep. I don't know how they're doing it. I would imagine they have good management in place to keep everything running smoothly. Yes. I agree. Their server came back with their drinks, and they gave her their order. Edward smiled up at the server and handed her his menu. She took Carrington's as well and then disappeared into the kitchen. I feel like you know all kinds of things about me, but I hardly know anything about you, Carrington said. Edward's smile disappeared. He pressed his hands together, resting his forearms on the table in front of him. What would you like to know? Why did he suddenly look so serious? Maybe he was a private person. Now she felt a little intimidated about asking him questions. Um, when you're not painting, what do you do for fun? That was a harmless enough question, right? That's easy. I love to go skiing. Mastonia has excellent snow in the mountains. What else? I love to sing karaoke and play pool, but you already knew that. What else? He paused for a moment like he was thinking. I love meeting new people. I love all those things too. Okay, so maybe this wasn't so bad. What about your family? Do you have any siblings? Just a younger brother. Lucky. I always wished I had brothers and sisters. Do you get along with him? Edward shook his head. We've always disagreed. That's a shame. Edward shrugged. It is what it is. He doesn't get along with my parents either. And you get along with your parents? For the most part. My father is not thrilled that I want to pursue art. What does he want you to do instead? Edward shifted in his seat and took a sip of his wine. Did she make him feel like she was interrogating him? He looked so uncomfortable. He wants me to take over the, uh, family business. She opened her mouth to ask him what the family business was, but his face had gone emotionless, like he'd put up walls. Maybe she really did need to back off with the questions. The subject must be a touchy one for Edward. She imagined his dad was probably pretty frustrated with him for pursuing art. How does he feel about you coming to Virginia? She really couldn't help herself, could she? She had to keep digging for information. Right now, she was being as bad as Mrs. Wheaton. Was that how she would end up? As the Newtown gossip, always bothering people to divulge their secrets? At least Mrs. Wheaton had a husband and a daughter. Carrington would probably be doomed to be single forever with other people's drama as her main source of entertainment. A faint smile touched Edward's lips. He doesn't have much choice. It's my life. You're lucky your father shares your interest in art. Well, he just expertly turned the conversation back to be about her. Carrington scoffed. Yeah, but that doesn't mean my relationship always goes smoothly with him either. You've seen that for yourself. He can be stubborn when he wants to be. My father is the same way. Their server came out with the bread. Oh, yes. Carrington squealed. This is the best part. They took turns sawing off slices of the bread and buttering them. It was warm and tasted like heaven. Edward bit into his slice. This is just as good as you said. Right? I told you. 
This is why I'd come to Hadley so much. They each had another slice. Carrington pushed her bread plate away from her. Okay. I'm cutting myself off. I need to save room for my chicken. Tell me about yourself, Edward said after he'd finished his bread. Is your mother still involved in your life? She died in childbirth. It's always just been my dad and me. A softness came over Edward's face. That's terribly tragic. It's all I know. I do wish I'd gotten to know my mom, though. People say I act like her. She was fun-loving and carefree. A bit of a free spirit. Did she paint too? Edward asked. No. My mom fully supported my dad with his work, but she always told him she didn't have an artistic bone in her body. She was going to school to be a math teacher when I was born and never got to fulfill her dream of teaching. How sad. My dad never remarried. After my mom died, he swore he would never love again. So I'd been the only woman in his life all this time. Do you ever wish he'd gotten remarried so you could have had a stepmom and siblings? I've thought about it from time to time, but he could have married someone awful. I never had to deal with all the drama a blended family can bring with it, and I'm grateful for that. And I've had friends who have been like family to me. Like Sully and Bryant? Sully's definitely like family to me, but Bryant? Not so much. She didn't know how she would define her relationship with Bryant. It had always been a little strained, like they hadn't completely mashed. That alone should have been a message from the universe that he wasn't right for her. What's wrong with Bryant? He's just so, how could she word this? Cocky. I noticed that right away about him. He still seems like a decent fellow. I guess. Is he dating Sully? Edward asked. Carrington shook her head. He wishes. She's not interested though. Oh, that sounds complicated. He had no idea. Although it was simpler now that Carrington had moved on from her stupid crush. Most of my close friends are married now. What about you? You have anyone special waiting for you back in Mastonia? She knew she was being nosy, but she couldn't help but ask. He cleared his throat. No. There's no one. That was a relief. It would have been awkward if he'd said yes. It kind of felt like they were on a date. He hadn't said it was, but she was getting the vibe that he'd meant for it to be. She didn't want to assume anything, but she wouldn't have liked it if he'd asked her to go to dinner with him if he had a girlfriend waiting for him back in Mastonia. Their server brought their food out, and they both ate in silence for a few moments. How do you like the chicken and dumplings? Carrington asked. It's delicious. I've never heard of this dish before. It's classic southern comfort food. He wiped his mouth with his linen napkin. What else do you eat in the south? Fried chicken. Mac and cheese. Collard greens. I've had fried chicken and mac and cheese. But collard greens is new to me. There's a home cooking restaurant in town that serves some. It's called Betty's Kitchen. I believe I saw that establishment when I was driving around town yesterday. We'll have to have you try it sometime. The way she'd worded that. It almost sounded like she was suggesting that they go out to dinner again. Or, I mean, you could go there on your own. You don't have to go with me. Edward put his hand over hers. I'd love to go with you. Oh, um. Okay. Her face was probably bright red. She hadn't meant to ask him out, but it kind of seemed like she just did. Carrington? She looked up to see Soraya and Kane walking toward a table nearby with a hostess. Oh, hey, guys. It looks like you two got away without the baby. Soraya beamed. She's with a sitter. We desperately needed to get out with only the two of us. Soraya held her hand out to Edward. Hi there. I'm Soraya. This is my husband, Kane. We haven't met you. Are you new in town? 
Yes, I've only just arrived. I'm studying under Robert Dalton. Oh, so that's how you know Carrington. Soraya said. I was wondering. Welcome to town. Kane reached out and shook his hand. Carrington looked at Edward. Remember how I told you some people around here were like family to me? Well, these two are some of the people I meant. It's a pleasure to meet you, Edward said. Where are you from? Soraya asked. Mastonia. Oh, really? She looked at her husband. Kane, have you ever been to Mastonia? She looked back at Edward. Kane's traveled all over the world. I can't keep track of all the countries he's visited. I haven't been there yet, Kane said. I'd love to have a reason to go there. From what I've heard, they have beautiful forests there, Soraya said. And castles. I've always wanted to tour a castle. We'll have to plan a tour of Europe then, Kane said. Really? Soraya squealed. Kane put his arm around her. Of course. Soraya looked up at him with love in her eyes. You're amazing, you know that, right? I just want the best for you. And I love to travel anyway, Kane said. Edwards traveled a lot too, Carrington said. Oh, yeah? Kane asked, looking over at Edward. Where have you been? All across Europe and a bit through Asia. Very cool, Kane said. Edward's helping me to plan a fundraising gala for the museum. We'd love it you two could come. Of course, we'll be there, Soraya said. We wouldn't miss it, Kane promised. Well, you two have fun. We're starving, so we're going to see if we can get some food. They left to go sit at the table where the hostess had placed their menus. Edward looked back to Carrington. Would you be interested in dessert? They have a delicious chocolate cake here. You should try it. Would you like to split a slice with me? Edward offered. Sure. I just have to go to the ladies' room first. Go ahead and order it while I'm gone. She got up and made her way to the bathroom. When she passed Soraya's table, she pulled out her phone and waved it at Carrington. Did she want her to text her? When Carrington got to the bathroom, she checked her phone. Soraya, are you dating this guy? You haven't gone out with anyone in ages. Soraya would know. They'd been close since high school. Carrington had been too wrapped up in Bryant to give another man a chance. Carrington, he asked me to grab dinner. I'm not even sure he's considering this a date. Soraya, it's totally a date. I saw the way he was looking at you. He wasn't looking at her in any sort of way. Just the regular kind of looking at someone. There was no way a guy like Edward would be interested in her. And if he was, he probably wouldn't ever want anything serious. Guys never did. They just wanted to play. At least the guys who'd hit on her in the past had. Carrington, whatever. I'm not assuming anything. Soraya, boo. You like this guy? Carrington, I don't know yet. Still getting to know him. He's secretive. I think he's hiding something. Soraya, be careful. I don't want you getting hurt. He's not married, is he? Great. Now she'd gotten Soraya paranoid. Her best friend had her own past with more than one guy who'd kept secrets from her, so she was ultra wary of any man with a dark, hidden past. She didn't know what Edward was hiding, but he was definitely acting a bit evasive. Carrington, he said he's not seeing anyone. Soraya, good. Keep me updated. Carrington, I will. She washed her hands and returned to her seat across from Edward's seconds, before their server showed up with a giant slice of chocolate cake and two forks. This night just keeps getting better and better. Oops. Did she just say that out loud? Edward probably thought she had a massive crush on him. How awkward. He didn't seem to mind, though. A gigantic smile spread across his face. They dug into the cake together. By the time they'd finished, 
Carrington felt like Edward was going to have to roll her out of the restaurant. That was delicious, Edward said. So how does Maple Creek's food line up with what you've tasted from across the world? Not bad. Owen Hadley did a wonderful job with this place. Well, if we get him to come to our gala, then you can tell him that yourself. It would be fun to plan the gala. She just hoped they'd be able to raise enough money for the roof. But with Edward by her side, she felt a lot better about putting everything together. As much as she didn't want to admit that to herself earlier that day, it was hard for her to accept his help. He wasn't even expecting her to pay him anything. He was just that nice of a person. Guys like that never paid this much attention to her. She only hoped she wouldn't do something stupid like fall for him. She'd seen how well that had ended in the past for her. Chapter 7 A couple of weeks passed, and all Edward could think about was Carrington. He hadn't seen her much lately. He'd begun running in the mornings to prepare for Carrington's 5K. She could use all the help she could get, so he'd signed up to run. By the time he'd showered and gotten to her house each morning, she'd been gone. Off and on, throughout the last couple of weeks, he'd had trouble focusing on what Richard was teaching him because he kept envisioning freckles and that attractive dimple. When he was preparing to leave Richard's one evening, Carrington opened the front door just as he was slipping on his coat, surprising him. Hello, he said. He'd missed her sweet smiles and bright eyes. Not to mention the great conversations they'd had. Oh, hey, Edward. All finished for the day? Yes. I was just leaving. He put his other arm into the sleeve. I was planning to try out Betty's kitchen tonight. Would you care to join me? Oh. She fiddled with her necklace, a delicate gold chain with a small gold pendant. I guess I could do that if you want me to. I asked you, didn't I? Right. Well, did you want to go right now? If that's all right with you. She tucked an auburn curl behind her ear. Sure. Let's go. Would you like to take my car? Edward offered. That's fine with me. Carrington followed him outside. Her eyes lit up as they walked out to his car. You know what you should try at Betty's? What? Grits. Ever had them before? I can't say that I have. Grits are a staple in the South. He opened the door for her. Do you eat them often? She shook her head and laughed, climbing into the car. Not really, but I do think of them when I imagine traditional Southern food. And do you like this food? She grinned. I do when they're made right. And Betty makes them, right? Betty's has the best grits in town, she assured him. He walked around to his side of the car and climbed inside. What are grits, he asked, putting on his seatbelt. It's like a porridge made from corn. But you put butter or cheese on top. You don't eat it sweet like oatmeal. He wrinkled his brow in confusion. You're excited to feed me porridge? That was food for babies. Not that he disliked it when he was small. But it was so simple. He was expecting more. Laughter bubbled up from Carrington's throat. You should see the look on your face. They're good. I promise. I will try it but I find it odd that you're speaking so highly of porridge. They drove over to Betty's and walked into the restaurant together. Fun fact, Carrington said when they stood in the lobby area, waiting to be seated. Betty's is one of the oldest restaurants in town. He looked around. It looked like it was built in the 1940s. Black and white photographs of the town hung on the wall, and red checkered tablecloths covered the tables. An enormous stone fireplace sat on one side of the room with a crackling fire. This is old. In Mastonia, the old restaurants dated back to the 1500s. It's old for Maple Creek. We have older restaurants. 
There's a place that's been open since the 1800s. How old is the building the museum is housed in? It was built in 1802. That must be very old for Maple Creek. It is. They were shown to a table, and Edward looked over the menu. Most of the foods looked like they were fried. Tell me what to order. I can try anything. Okay. Carrington opened her menu. Do you like chicken or fish better? The catfish is pretty good here. Fish. Okay, so get catfish, mac and cheese, collard greens, and a side of grits. That should be a good sample of what southern cooking is like. The chocolate cake at Hadley's was delicious. What about dessert? For dessert, she glanced over the menu. Ooh. Try the pecan pie. It's fantastic here. Their server arrived, and he repeated what Carrington had suggested he order. She chose the meatloaf with green beans and a salad. When their food came, he bit into the fried catfish. The breading was crispy, and the fish tasted as if it was caught this morning. This is delicious. He tried the mac and cheese. It was creamy and rich. Also, good. Try the grits now. He switched to a spoon and dipped it into the mushy dish. Make sure you get some of the cheese on your first bite. It makes a big difference. He did as she instructed. This is surprisingly good. See. I told you. Betty's grits are the best. He tried the collard greens. They weren't nearly as good as the other foods he'd tried so far. I don't think I like these. Carrington laughed. Those might be a bit of an acquired taste. They're a bit bitter. It's all part of the Southern experience. They finished up their food, and the server brought them each a slice of pecan pie with vanilla ice cream. Edward cut into the dessert and tasted it. This is divine. It was just the right combination of nutty and sweet with a warm, flaky crust. I really should stop eating so many desserts. Carrington shoveled another forkful of pecan pie into her mouth. I'm going to put on too much weight. You look just fine the way you are, Edward said. But I like fitting into my clothes. She pushed the plate back. I'm too full to eat another bite. You are beautiful, no matter your size. She blushed. It's nice of you to say that, but it doesn't mean I should gorge myself either. Edward asked for the check and paid with cash, leaving a generous tip. He'd been staying away from using his credit cards since he'd been in America. He didn't want his brother's men tracking him. So far, he'd been able to stay under the radar, but his brother was a power-hungry man and would stop at nothing to find him. Ready to go? Yep. I couldn't eat another bite if I wanted. He stood up. Thank you for the suggestion. Betty's was very good. And now I feel like I know Maple Creek a little bit better. She glanced toward the door. Edward? Why is there a guy taking our picture? He tensed up. Someone took our picture? Was it the paparazzi? Had they found him here? Maybe someone had recognized him and tipped off the press. If that was the case, it wouldn't be long before his brother found him. Don't make a big deal of it, but look over to your left, Carrington whispered. See the guy in the black leather jacket with the short, cropped hair? Edward casually looked over in that direction and didn't recognize the man standing near the exit. He stalked over to the man. Did you just take a picture of us? Before he could reach him, the man darted from the restaurant and disappeared into the night. Edward dashed after him. He pushed open the door to the restaurant and glimpsed the man getting into a car pulled up to the curb. He ran after the car, but it pulled away before he could get close. Carrington rushed to his side. Edward. What is going on? Why would that guy take a picture of us and then run off like that? I don't know. He had a few ideas, 
but he couldn't voice any of them to Carrington. I should get you home. That could have been the paparazzi, but it could have been one of his brother's men. He could have put Carrington in danger tonight, and it would have been his fault. He needed to call his father right away to update him on the situation. He'd been letting his guard down, since the town had seemed so quiet and safe, but now he realized that had been a mistake. Nowhere was safe for him. He ushered Carrington to his car. Tell me what's going on. Are you in some kind of trouble? His chest felt incredibly tight. Everything is fine. I just got a little worried. He tried his best to soothe her. The last thing he needed was her digging for information and getting more involved than she already was. You totally freaked out on that guy. You're scaring me. She would be a lot more afraid if she knew the danger she might be in. He had to find out who those men were. He'd seen the first few letters on the license plates of the black Honda Accord. If he was trying to get photos of him, he had a feeling he'd be seeing him again. He'd be on the lookout for the car around town. He drove Carrington home, and the entire way back, she watched him suspiciously. I feel you're hiding something from me. He looked over at her when he pulled up to her house. You're determined to find out what's going on, aren't you? I feel like I deserve answers. They were taking my picture too. Edward had to stop spending so much time with Carrington. He enjoyed her company, but it wasn't worth it to endanger her safety. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if anything happened to her. And he couldn't give her answers. The more she knew, the more in danger she would be. Good night, Carrington. Her mouth fell open. You're just going to leave it like that? She crossed her arms over her chest. Fine. Have it your way. She shut the car door and went into the house. That could have gone better. But he couldn't think of a reason to tell her people might want to take pictures of him. Edward drove off. He had bigger problems than Carrington's anger right now. He had a phone call to make. His phone was connected through the speakers of the car. He pulled up to a stop sign and called his father's direct line. It took a moment to connect. Father. Edward? His voice sounded sleepy. Is everything all right? It's almost two in the morning. I'm fine. At least, he was for now. Sorry to call you at such a late hour. You shouldn't be calling. Your phone could be traced. I believe I've already been found. Or I soon may be. He related the entire story to his father. Where are you? Before now I would have said it wasn't safe for you to tell me, but it sounds like your position has been compromised. I'm in Maple Creek, Virginia. What's in Maple Creek? I'm studying under an art master. I see. He knew his father was tired of his pursuit of art, but if it bothered him, he didn't mention it. How could they have tracked you? We don't actually know these are Ramsey's men. I could have been recognized, and a local townsperson could have reported me to the paparazzi. Have you done anything over email? He gripped the steering wheel, his knuckles turning white. Well, yes. I sent an email with my website to the man I'm working with. They could have hacked his email and found Richard's location. That put Richard in danger as well. He was the biggest fool. He should have brought a hard copy of his portfolio or just given Richard a card with his website on it. I'm going to send men there to ensure you have extra protection. Are you sure that's necessary? Edward protested. We don't even know who was taking my picture. He pulled into his driveway. I will take every precaution to keep you safe. I wish you'd let me send men with you when you first went over there. Edward hadn't told his father his location at first because he had wanted to do it alone, but now, Carrington was involved. And that changed everything. Thank you, father. Edward's hands shook. Can you send men to watch over Richard's home as well? 
I feel I've endangered him and his daughter who lives with him. He gave him their name and address, as well as his own. We need to end this call. It's not safe. Please, give me your word they will be watched over. You have my word. They will be protected. Goodbye, son. Goodbye. He hung up. When he arrived at his apartment, he looked around for the black Honda. When he couldn't see any sign of it, he opened the glove compartment and took out a pistol. He tucked it into the top of his pants before exiting the vehicle. He would feel a lot safer with that by his side when he slept. But what would keep Carrington safe? He'd pushed her away with no explanation. And she could be in that picture too, which could make her a target. Even if the photographer was the paparazzi, she would appear in the media and his brother would be sure to see it. He needed to stay far away from her. He didn't want to. In fact, he wasn't sure he could. Chapter 8 Carrington woke up furious as the events from the night before flooded back to her. She threw the covers back and stormed off to the bathroom. Why was Edward being so secretive? She was part of this now. There was nothing she hated more than being shut out and left in the dark. By the time she'd showered, she'd calmed down a bit more, but she was still upset. She went to start the coffee maker, and her dad was already starting a pot. She huffed and tapped her fingers on the counter. Is everything all right? You seem tense. Edward is keeping things from me. Is there some reason he needs to tell you everything about him? She opened her mouth to speak, but then promptly shut it. He had a good point. Edward had no obligation to explain himself to her. Except for the fact that she might have been in the picture the mysterious creep took of them. There was a suspicious-looking guy at Betty's last night taking our picture. How do you know he was taking a picture of you and not someone else? Edward Shore seemed to think the guy was taking a picture of us. He went to confront him, and the guy took off running and got in a car that sped away like it was waiting for him. That does seem odd. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for it. You should have seen how upset Edward was. He's definitely been hiding something. I don't think he is who he says he is. Listen to yourself. Edward is just a painter. Nothing more. Then explain why people are taking pictures of him and then running off like they're guilty of something. I think you've been too stressed out with the museum. You should think about taking some time off. Maybe take a camping trip with your friends. Edward seemed really freaked out. I don't think you're listening to me, Dad. He patted her on the back. It'll all work itself out. He filled his cup of coffee and walked back to his studio. Carrington poured a cup of coffee and tasted it. She made a face and poured it into the sink. She was going to need better coffee than this if she was going to get through this day. Her dad had bought the off-brand again. She finished getting ready and headed out to Josie's. She drove across town and went into the cozy coffee shop. Hey there, Carrington. Josie smiled at her from behind the counter. They'd gone to high school together. Good morning. She stepped up to the counter and gave Josie her order. She leaned against the counter as she waited for her coffee. A familiar black jacket caught her eye. The man from Betty's sat in the back corner, sipping a cup. Her hands shook, and she balled them into fists. He caught her looking at him, and he nodded in her direction. He got up, tossed his cup in the trash, and left. Here's your coffee, Carrington. Josie's cheerful sing-song voice caught her attention. Hey, Josie? Do you know that guy that just left? I've never seen him before. He had a strange accent, though. Sounded European. European? Like someone from Estonia? Josie shrugged. I wouldn't know. Hey, are you okay? You look a little pale. I'm fine. I just need some coffee. Thanks, Josie. She sank into a chair and sipped the hot liquid. 
The door to the shop opened, and Edward came inside. He saw her right away, and she waved him over. He straightened, but slowly approached her. I need to talk to you. He sat at her table. I'm sorry about how last night ended. She dug her nails into her palms. She needed to calm down before she snapped at him. It wasn't cool. I deserve more of an explanation than what you gave me. But thank you for apologizing. I'm only trying to protect you. I don't want you getting dragged into this mess. It might be too late for that. The photographer was just here. Edward's head snapped toward her, his features going taut. What? You saw him. Are you sure it was him? She nodded. Positive. He had the same jacket on. And he nodded at me like he recognized me. Did you speak to him? She shook her head. No. As soon as he saw me, he got up and left. I need to know what he wants with me. There's something else. He leaned toward her. What is it? I talked to Josie. She said the man had a European accent. Edward blanched. Do you think he's from Estonia? He seems awfully interested in you. Edward's shoulders slumped. I haven't been completely open with you about my situation. Why did you come to Maple Creek? Are you hiding from someone? Carrington reached out and touched his hand. You can trust me. It's not that I don't trust you. I want to protect you. The less you know about me, the better. But you've already been seen with me, so there's not much I can do about that now. Carrington squared her shoulders. I don't need you to protect me. I can take care of myself. These people are dangerous. I don't want to scare you, but I want you to understand how serious the situation is. Then tell me what's going on. She rubbed her forehead. This entire situation was giving her a headache. Edward frustrated her in a way no other guy had done. Not even Bryant. Bryant wasn't a secretive guy. It was a no-brainer that he liked Sully. He was basically an open book. She was starting to care too much about Edward. Somehow, over the short time she'd known him, she developed feelings for him, even though she was pretty sure he didn't return them. Would she end up being the person with one-sided feelings yet again? But she couldn't help the fluttering in her belly whenever she saw him. Or the way her heart pounded whenever his gaze met hers. That was why all of this secretiveness was starting to get to her. Once again, she cared too much, and she didn't know how to stop. Last night, I felt like I needed to stay away from you to keep you safe, but now I'm thinking that it would be better if I kept you close to me to watch over you. It's not like you can keep your distance anyway, unless you were planning to leave town and end your apprenticeship. Edward shook his head. We're not to that point yet. What does this guy want from you, Edward? Why would he want to take your picture? I can't give you too many details. Let's just say I have something they want. He reached up and stroked her cheek. I won't let them hurt you. She closed her eyes, savoring his touch. She suddenly wanted him to kiss her. What would his lips feel like on hers? Would they be soft? Strong? He took his hand off her cheek, and she opened her eyes, reality hitting her. She couldn't fantasize about this guy. She would only end up with a broken heart if she got too emotionally involved. I should get going. I still haven't ordered my coffee. He stood up. Right. I have to get to the museum. Can I see you tonight? Well, you did say you wanted to watch out for me. She wouldn't allow herself to hope that he wanted to see her because he wanted to be with her in any romantic sense. Yes. I want to watch over you. He grinned at her. His smile sent her heart into a flutter. He couldn't just do that to her. It might be bad for her health. Anyway, she was sure he meant it in a strictly platonic way. He probably just wanted to do his part to keep her safe since she'd gotten roped into whatever dangerous situation he might be involved in. Right?
A week later, Carrington was closing up the museum for the night when Edward showed up in the parking lot. He must have just come from her house. She turned to him and smiled. Hey, Edward. How are the lessons going? We're making progress. I've learned a lot in the weeks since I've been here. She locked up the building and tucked her keys in her pocket. I know you were just leaving, but do you want to go back to my place? I can make us some dinner. You cook? Edward asked. I'm no gourmet chef, but I can whip up a few dishes. What did you have in mind? How about chicken fettuccine? Sounds delicious. I'd love to have dinner with you. He fell into step beside her. Have you noticed anyone out of place hanging around the museum this week? Not that I could tell. I spend most of my time in my office, so if anyone came looking for me, they likely wouldn't have seen me walking around. His shoulders seemed to relax at that comment. I'm sorry, I pulled you into all of this. Well, I hope we can work all of it out, but let's think about the yummy food I'm about to make instead. A warm meal will make everything seem better, even if for a moment. They made their way inside the house, and Carrington made a beeline to the kitchen. In no time, she was setting the table and putting steaming dishes of pasta and chicken alfredo sauce on the table. She dumped a pre-mixed bag of salad into a bowl and set it next to the other dishes. They sat down and filled their plates with the dinner. Edward twisted the pasta around on his fork and put it to his mouth. This is excellent. Carrington couldn't help the smile that widened across her face. Thanks. I'm glad you're not gagging on my food. He laughed. Far from it. Her dad came in from his studio. Something smells good. Fix yourself a plate, Dad. There's plenty. He sat at the table with them and loaded food on his plate. He looked between them, a mischievous look in his eyes. You've been spending a lot of time around Carrington outside of working hours. Are you courting my daughter, Edward? Carrington's eyes widened. How could her dad ask a question like that? How much more humiliating could it get? Edward coughed. Sir, I... Her dad broke out into laughter. You should see the look on your face. It's like you're staring at a firing squad. Carrington felt her cheeks flush. She didn't want Edward to answer the question. She wasn't sure she could handle the rejection. How are the preparations for the fundraisers coming? Edward asked, changing the subject. Carrington was grateful they were no longer talking about their romantic situation, or lack of it, rather. It's going well. I was able to put out some announcements on social media today, and I contacted several local businesses who are willing to help me spread the word. Have you had a chance to update the website with a donation button? I spoke with my web designer yesterday. They should be working on that this week. It sounds like you're making good progress. Her dad stayed quiet during their exchange. She knew he didn't like it that she was fundraising, but at least he wasn't trying to talk her out of it. It was progress. I should probably clean up. Carrington stood and took her plate to the sink. Allow me to do the dishes. Edward walked to the sink and she stepped back. She couldn't help but smile. Only if you insist. She hated doing dishes. If he was going to offer, she wouldn't complain. In fact, she could kiss him. There were few things more attractive than a man who cleaned. But Edward didn't seem to know what he was doing. He peered at the dishwasher like it was from another planet, walking around to view it from different angles. Is everything okay? Yes, yes. It's fine. He took one of the plates, still covered in sauce, and put it on the top rack. This doesn't seem to fit here. He moved it to the bottom, sauce from the plate dripping all over the dishwasher. But then he faced it toward the outside. You'll want to make sure the plates are facing the middle. And you should probably rinse off the dishes before they go in the dishwasher. Otherwise, they won't get clean. You have to wash them before putting them in? What's the point of that? Carrington laughed. 
that's just the way it is. Edward grumbled as he washed off the last of the dishes and put them in, this time facing the front. You don't have dishwashers in Macedonia? Edward looked perplexed. I, uh. He cleared his throat. Of course we do. I just usually, clean the dishes the regular way. Her dad disappeared to the back of the house, leaving Edward and Carrington alone again. How would you feel about taking a walk, she asked. The gardens behind the museum are beautiful at night when the lights are on. I'd love to. She grabbed her jacket and they went outside through the front door. It's a nice night. Edward looked up at the sky. You can see the stars really well from here. They walked across the grass, their feet crunching over the fallen leaves. The air was crisp but not too unbearably cold. It was unseasonably warm for early November. How are plans going for the 5K, he asked. They're coming along nicely. Are you going to race? Yes. I've been training in the mornings. Edward threaded his fingers through hers. Is this okay? Yes, it's fine. Edward wanted to hold her hand? What did that mean? Was he interested in pursuing something with her? His fingers were warm where they touched the skin on the back of her hand. She longed for him to hold her and thread them through her hair, feel his touch on her scalp, but she couldn't let her imagination run wild. She'd better focus on the topic at hand. It's great that you plan to run the 5K. It means a lot that you're so supportive. Of course. I wouldn't have it any other way. Silence hung between them for a moment as they walked. Sorry about my dad hounding you about, she made air quotes, courting me. He can be so embarrassing. I think he just isn't used to me being with a guy alone. You haven't dated much? No. I've been very single for a very long time. That's a shame. It sounds like the men of Maple Creek are a bunch of fools. Carrington was grateful for the darkness, because she was sure her face was bright red. You sure do know how to sweet-talk a woman. I'm sure you had swarms of women fighting over you, in Macedonia. Edward grew quiet for a moment, and Carrington wondered if she'd said something wrong. You'd be surprised how quickly women can change their minds about me. What do you mean? I was dating a girl named Elizabeth. I found out she wanted me for the wrong reasons. Turns out that's a common thing with me. I've yet to find someone who wants me for me. What are the wrong reasons? It's complicated. I don't want to get into it too much. But my trust in women is very low. Especially in Macedonia. Not so much here in Virginia. You're being very cryptic. He was the most mysterious guy she'd ever met, and she wasn't sure it was a good thing. It sounded like he was hiding something. Maybe he was wealthy like she'd originally thought. They could be after him for his money. They approached the gardens, and Carrington led him to the backside of the museum. Watch this. She opened a small electric box and flipped a switch. Strings of twinkle lights lit the trellis above them and the surrounding trees, and a fountain came to life. This is cozy. He took her hand and led her over to a cushioned bench near the gurgling fountain. It's a little chilly. I think we should sit close to keep each other warm. Oh, is that what you told the girls in Macedonia to get them to chase you? He laughed, but it didn't sound like his heart was in it. No. It's what I say to the girl I want to get to know better. The one I want to know me. The real me. She sat next to him. How can I know the real you if you're so secretive? He sighed. I know this is hard for you. But you can still get to know me without knowing everything. You know I love painting, and I have skills in running a museum. I love to try new food. You have a great laugh, and you're willing to roll your sleeves up and work hard. She looked up at him, and his eyes softened. Thank you. He reached up and threaded his fingers lightly through her hair. She closed her eyes and leaned her head against his shoulder, savoring the feeling. How long had it been since a man had touched her so gently, yet intimately? 
she'd dated a little, but it never went anywhere. Who knew if this would go anywhere, but thinking about that would spoil the mood. Right now, it was time to relax and enjoy the attention. Let what wanted to be, be. Edward twisted toward her and looked at her with desire in his eyes. Her heart pounded at the intensity of his gaze. I would like to kiss you, Carrington. May I, he murmured in her ear. Her breath caught. How could she ever say no to a request like that? This beautiful man wanted to kiss her? Yes, you may. He brought his lips to hers, and they were softer than she'd imagined. This was a man who knew what he was doing. He pulled her closer to him and tenderly kissed her like she was a prize to be treasured. Her head spun with the perfectness of it all. He tilted her head back and deepened the kiss. She reached up and felt the softness of his hair beneath her hands. He pulled away and looked into her eyes. Well, now I know something else about you. And what's that? He whispered against her lips as he kissed her again. You're an amazing kisser. Chapter 9 Edward smiled at the compliment and bent his head down to kiss her again. You're not so bad yourself. In fact, she was wonderful. Her kisses curled his toes and sent tingles down his spine. He stroked her hair as he kissed her, and it was every bit as soft as he'd imagined. He hadn't kissed anyone since Elizabeth because he didn't give kisses away easily. Carrington was special. He couldn't deny that he'd been powerfully drawn to her from the moment he'd met her. Her breath was warm on his cheek as he pulled away, and he looked into her green eyes. You're a beautiful woman. She held his gaze. Thank you. She looked so vulnerable, so trusting. Should he tell her the truth about his identity? If he was kissing her, didn't she deserve to know who she was with? He was tampering with her heart now and being with a prince was an enormous commitment. She didn't know what she was getting herself into. At least he'd warned her that there was danger surrounding his situation. But it benefited him to keep her in the dark. At least he'd know that she was interested in him for who he was on the inside instead of just going after his title. That had been the problem with every other woman he'd encountered. He wanted to pursue this woman, to properly, court, her as her father had suspected. He'd just have to proceed without her knowing everything about him. It was the only way he could be sure that she truly wanted him. He just hoped she didn't get too upset when she found out his true identity because he wouldn't be able to keep it from her forever. Just until he was sure she was safe from his brother and that her feelings for him were genuine. She pulled away from him. We should probably call it a night. Okay. As much as he didn't want to say goodnight to her, he also wanted to respect her wishes. But he could have sat outside, kissing her all night. I'll walk you back to your door. He stood up and took her hand to help Carrington to her feet. These gardens are lovely. It must take a lot to keep them up. Yes. We've had a team of landscapers work on it for years. Many of our weddings are held out here when weather permits. It would be a lovely place to be married. His parents had always planned for him to have a huge wedding in Mastonia's main cathedral. She walked next to Edward as they headed back to her home. Have you ever thought about marriage? The importance of a reputable match had been drilled into him from birth. It's expected of me. Wow. Your parents sound pretty old school. Plenty of people don't get married anymore. But beyond what's expected of you, is it what you want? I, uh, no one had ever asked him what he wanted. Marriage had always been a big part of his future. He'd always expected that he would end up with some woman his parents had chosen for him. Marrying for love was too much to hope for. He'd thought he'd had it with Elizabeth, but that had turned out to be about his title. He'd been a fool to think he could have something real. He'd since resigned himself to the fact that his future wife would be someone good for the leadership of the country. A crown prince didn't have the luxury of running off with some random woman he'd fallen in love with. 
she needed to be strong enough to withstand the responsibilities of the throne. But how could he explain all that to Carrington without revealing too much about his title? You seem like you're at a loss for words, Carrington pointed out. I didn't mean to bring up such a sensitive topic. Edward waved off her concern. No, it's fine. He steadied his voice to sound more convincing that it was, in fact, fine. I would like to get married, yes. A full, happy marriage where his wife loved him for who he was on the inside was too much to hope for. He'd fallen into the trap of wanting something he wasn't likely to ever have. He'd learned from his naivety, and he wouldn't be making that mistake again. Elizabeth had shattered that completely for him. Yes, he was bitter but at least he was being realistic now. Were you planning to marry that girl you dated? Elizabeth? At one time, I saw it as a very real possibility. But then, I learned of her true character. She was much shallower than I'd first realized, and she wasn't supportive of my art. She looked at it as a silly hobby. I never really understood that until I overheard her talking to my brother one night. It was much more than that, but it was all Edward could reveal to Carrington in that moment. What did she say to your brother? She said she thought I spent too much time talking about art and not enough time focusing on, more serious things. It sounded like something my father would have said. But that wasn't the worst part. I eventually caught her kissing my brother. Seriously? Carrington stopped walking and looked at him in the moonlight. Edward, that's awful. I'm so sorry. When I confronted her about it, she said his goals aligned more with what she was looking for. I found out she'd only ever wanted to be with me because of the future she thought I was going to have. The one my father had planned for me. So she just wanted a guy with the mainstream career? And an artist's career wasn't doing it for her? That was one way to put it although he wasn't sure how mainstream being the king of Mastonia was. Her dreams didn't align with mine. I realized she couldn't accept me for who I truly am inside. It was all about the outward image for her. He wasn't planning to give up the throne, but when she'd heard of his brother's plans to take over the kingdom, she'd sided with him. It had been the ultimate betrayal. She'd given information about his whereabouts to Ramsay the night the assassins attempted to take his life. As they reached Carrington's front porch, she hesitated and turned. Good night, Edward. He took his hand and tilted her chin to look up at him. Thank you for seeing me as I truly am. And thank you for loving art. It means a lot to me. He bent down and kissed her lightly on the lips. He pulled back, and her eyes were big and luminous. You should pursue what you love. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Could he turn his back on his country and let Ramsay have the throne? It was tempting to spend the rest of his days in this place, painting beside Richard, spending time with Carrington. Ramsay was the one who cared so much about ruling. Why not let him rule? He was smart and shrewd. Edward could lay this battle within him to rest. Fully immerse himself in his art without worrying about the politics back home. I'm not used to anyone talking to me like that. He'd had it drilled into his head that he had a duty to the crown. He was born to rule, and everyone around him had constantly reminded him of that. Until now. It's refreshing to hear your perspective. You can do whatever you want, Edward. You're a free man. But was he? If only she knew what he'd have to give up to experience that freedom. I'm not as free as you may imagine. You just need to think for yourself. Don't let other people dictate what's best for you and your life. It's complicated. Carrington cocked her head to the side. Is it about the money? You know, money isn't everything. I know being an artist may not pay all that well, but does it really matter if you get to do what you love? How did she know he had money? He must have given that impression at some point. It's not about the money. 
That much was true. His father wouldn't cut him off financially if he stayed in Maple Creek to paint and let Ramsay have the throne. He would be disappointed, but he'd still allow Edward his normal allotment of money. Of course, that amount would be much more if he'd become king. But the money had never mattered to Edward. Then what is it? It's about letting my father down. Letting myself down. You wouldn't be letting yourself down by choosing your artwork. It's your life, not your father's life. There's more at play here that you don't understand, Carrington. She jutted her jaw out. Maybe if you just told me what was going on, I'd understand. I've already told you quite a bit. She sighed. I'm sorry, I'm so nosy. I just want to help and feel like I don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. It's frustrating to want to help and to be unable to do anything. He placed his hands on her shoulders. You have helped. I'm thinking about what you've said tonight. My artwork is important to me. There's a part of me that would like to just stay here in Maple Creek and paint for the rest of my life. Then why do I hear a, but, in your voice? It seems like it should be a simple decision. Life was so simple for Carrington. She had a father who loved art. She could pursue what she loved without judgment or any negative consequences. Because of the responsibilities I have in Mastonia. It must have been the wrong thing to say because Carrington looked away from him. I see. Does that upset you? She looked back to his eyes. No, she said coolly. Why would that bother me? You have a life there. I just don't know much about it. Perhaps you could come to visit one day and see what my life is truly like there. Maybe, she didn't sound convinced, though. Look, I would never tell you what to do with your life. It's up to you. But I, she hesitated. I should go inside. I've taken up enough of your time tonight. She turned toward the door, and he caught her hand. Every moment I've spent with you tonight has been wonderful. Please don't think anything different. Her hand rested on the doorknob for a moment. She turned back to him. Thank you, Edward. That means a lot to me. I had a great time with you, too. Besides my dad, I don't know too many guys around here who share my love of painting. I mean, someone close to my age. I know plenty of old men who paint and come to the museum to tell me about it. Edward chuckled. Are you saying you're interested in me because I paint? She bit her bottom lip for a moment before speaking. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. Well, that's a change. She smiled at him. Don't read too much into it. We don't need you getting a big head or anything. I'm just used to girls pretending to be interested in painting to get my attention. Rarely do they actually care. What about in art school? You must have been around some girls there who were passionate about painting. There were some. But I was too focused on my studies to date. He'd been lucky to even go to art school and he hadn't wanted to waste any of that time on courting a woman for the throne. He'd figured there would be plenty of time for that later. Always the dutiful son, he hadn't wanted to get emotionally involved with someone his parents wouldn't approve of as the future queen. Looking back on it now, he wished he'd taken more time to know some of the other art students who'd shared his love of painting. One of those women would have been a better pick for his wife than one of the aristocrats his parents often invited to the palace. Elizabeth had been perfect for them, on paper. She checked every box. As a daughter of a Mastonian duke, she'd been bred to become royalty. And that was what she'd expected from him. She was after the throne, and that was all. She craved power every bit as much as Ramsay did. It was no wonder that they'd ended up together. Edward had talked one too many times about art to her. She'd pretended to care, but he could tell she'd been bored by his ramblings. She was more interested in political intrigue. Just like Ramsay. Edward, Carrington, said, 
cutting into his thoughts. How long do you think you'll stay in Maple Creek? I don't know. It was the honest answer. I guess I didn't realize your stay here was so temporary. I should have figured that you would have a life to go back to in Mastonia. Was she getting attached to him? She really shouldn't. She didn't know much about him. And after everything blew over with Ramsay, he'd only have to go back to Mastonia to court the next aristocrat his parents chose for him. As much as he cared for Carrington, he didn't want to see her get hurt. I do have a life back there. There are people counting on me. An entire country of people. Then why did you bother to come here, anyway? Aren't there artists in Mastonia you could have studied under? I can't tell you too much, but you know the man taking my picture? Yes. It has to do with that. It wasn't safe for me to be back there. It doesn't seem that safe for you to be here, either. They seem to know where you are. I'm taking measures to ensure I'm safe here. And you too. I don't want any harm to come to you. What measures? Wait. Let me guess, you can't tell me that for my own protection. Edward's mouth turned downward. I'm sorry that I have to be so private. I know it's hard for you. I get it. You have your secrets. It's fine. But it's my life too. You've dragged me into this whether you meant to or not. She was right. He just hoped he didn't live to regret it. Chapter 10 Carrington woke just before her alarm went off. She was a fool who'd allowed herself to start falling for a guy who wouldn't even stick around. He wasn't willing to give up whatever life he had in Mastonia to pursue something with her. She'd been an idiot to think for one moment that maybe he'd consider moving to Maple Creek permanently. After letting him kiss her, Carrington's heart was tangled up in the situation. Shouldn't she have known better? She climbed out of bed and turned off her alarm so it wouldn't buzz. Usually, she went straight into the shower, but she needed coffee. Stopping by the store yesterday, she bought her favorite brand of coffee. She padded into the kitchen in her pajamas. Once her coffee was brewed and prepared just how she liked it with plenty of cream, she sat at the table and savored the warm drink. A container of mini muffins from Alexis Bakery sat on the table. She popped it open and stuffed one into her mouth. It wasn't the healthiest breakfast, but who cared? They were carbs, something she desperately needed that morning. She leaned back in her chair and moaned as the sugar from the muffins and the caffeine from her coffee hit her bloodstream. She felt better already. All she needed now was a hot, steamy shower, and she'd feel like a brand new woman. She'd get Edward out of her head and focus on the 5K that was coming up. She still needed to reach out to small businesses in the area to make sure the word was getting out. It felt amazing to finally utilize the fundraising skills she'd learned in college. She'd missed years of opportunity, no thanks to her dad's stubbornness. Carrington finished her coffee and two more muffins and headed to the bathroom to take her shower. She stayed in longer than she usually took, but that didn't matter. She needed every bit of time under the hot water to de-stress from her conversation with Edward the night before. Stepping out of the shower, she hummed cheerful tune. She dried off her hair and spritzed in some leave-in conditioner before brushing through it. Wrapping the towel around herself and opening the bathroom door, she shook her hips to the song she was humming. Nothing else would ruin her morning. A wall of muscle ran right into her left shoulder as she stepped into the hallway. Carrington screeched and clutched at her towel to keep it from slipping down. She looked up to see Edward's wide eyes focused on her. Carrington. His face turned a deep shade of red, and it looked like he was fighting to keep his eyes on her face. That was just great. Oh. Hi, Edward. Was it just her, or did her voice sound artificially high-pitched? She held onto her towel like it was her lifeline. She'd come way too close to dropping it when she'd slammed into him. He would have gotten a show he hadn't been planning on that morning. He'd already seen way too much. Why was she standing in the middle of the hallway, gaping at him? I, uh... 
I should probably go get dressed. He gave her a tight smile. That might be best. She stepped to the left to walk around him, but at the same moment, he moved in the same direction. Oh. Sorry. You go first. He put a hand to the side. Um, thanks. Her face flushed, and it wasn't just from the hot shower she'd taken. From now on, it would be a shower first and then coffee. Carrington? Why are you in the hallway in nothing but a towel? Her dad stood in the doorway to his studio. He must have heard them and had come to see what all the ruckus was. I don't know, dad. I thought I'd try a new look. She rolled her eyes. He grimaced disapprovingly at her. Maybe you ought to take your clothes into the bathroom to change from now on. Edward had his back to her dad, and it looked like he was fighting to keep a smile off his face. I really don't mind if Carrington wants to walk around in a towel. Edward. My dad is standing right there. You're going to get yourself kicked out of here. Her dad's eyes bulged. Just go in your room and get some clothes on, Carrington. Edward laughed. You'd better listen to your father. He sounds pretty serious. Very funny. Holding her head high, she walked into her room, shut the door, and leaned against it, letting out a puff of breath. A glimpse in the mirror over her dresser revealed wet hair and nothing but a towel. Not a scrap of makeup on her face. How humiliating. And Edward had the audacity to make a joke about the situation right in front of her dad. What was he thinking? She changed into her work clothes and then did her makeup. She glanced at her smart watch. Great. Now she was running late. She didn't have time to blow dry her hair, so she worked some product into it to allow it to dry naturally. Couldn't she just hide in her room for the rest of the day? She had her laptop in there with her. She could work from home, right? But eventually she'd need to go to the bathroom, and she'd probably just run into Edward again. He'd probably want to know why she was still hanging around the house. That would just make everything much more awkward. She might as well get it over with, and then she could escape to her office at the museum and hide in there all day. She cracked open her bedroom door and peeked out to see if Edward was around. His voice came from her dad's studio. Good. This was her chance to escape. She pushed open the door with her laptop bag on her shoulder. She tiptoed across the wood floor of the hallway. A floorboard creaked underfoot, and Edward came out to face her. Headed to the museum? She whirled around to face him. Keep a straight face. Don't blush. Um, yeah. I was on my way there now. Want to meet up for lunch? I had some ideas that might help with the gala. I'd like to go over them with you. Oh. Couldn't she think of an excuse, some reason she couldn't go to lunch with him? She'd faced enough humiliation for one day, thank you very much. But her mind was coming up blank. Your dad recommended an Italian restaurant in town. I'd like to try it. Raviolis? Yes. That's it. He loves that place. It was pretty fancy too. She was a sucker for a good cantaloupe meal, even if it was just lunch. And who could say no to pasta? It was the ultimate comfort food, and she could use some comfort today. Her nerves were shot, but a romantic dinner with Edward wasn't ideal. She needed to stop falling for him. It wasn't going to work well if they kept going out and spending so much time together. She could see how this would end. She'd fall for him like the fool she'd proven herself to be in the past. Then he'd leave her in the dust for whatever responsibilities he had in Mastonia. So, what do you say? Will you go with me? Sure, she said, even though she knew she shouldn't. But she really wanted to. Great. I'll meet you at your office at noon. She forced a smile. Perfect. See you then. Edward showed up right on time for their lunch date. She ended her call with Layla, who owned a local flower shop. How are your fundraising efforts going? Edward asked. 
so far, better than I expected. I just got another sponsor for the 5K. It pays to have a lot of friends in town who own small businesses. What about the t-shirts? Edward asked. She grabbed her purse and shouldered it. She grinned at him. I used my amazing artistic talent to come up with a design for them yesterday, she joked. I'd love to see it. She pulled up an image on her phone and showed it to him. I thought I'd have the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. He stepped close to her to look over her shoulder at the picture. She could smell his cologne, and she had to keep from swooning too obviously. She could stay close to him all day. But that kind of thinking wouldn't get her very far. She should know from experience that crushing on an unavailable guy only brought heartbreak. You weren't kidding about your artistic talent. This is great. Oh. She waved away his compliment with heat in her cheeks. I was just being sarcastic about that. You don't need to though. You're very good. She scratched her head. Well, thanks, I guess. I don't think you've shown me any of your work before this, Edward said. I don't think I have. I'll have to show you some of my stuff sometime. It's clear you have your dad's gift as well. I don't know if I'd go that far. But thank you all the same. On the drive over, they discussed plans for the gala, bouncing ideas off each other. They pulled up to the restaurant, and her mouth watered from the amazing aromas coming from the building. She'd been craving raviolis ever since Edward had suggested it that morning. Their garlic bread was to die for. They walked to the entrance, and two men with black suits and sunglasses got out of a black sedan and followed them into the restaurant. One was blonde and the other was bald. She leaned over to Edward. Did you see those guys? He glanced back over his shoulder at the two men but kept a strangely neutral expression on his face. Yes, I see them. What about them? They look kind of intense, like secret service members, or something. They even have those earpieces, like they're getting orders from someone in another location. He led her up to the hostess stand too please. He turned to Carrington. What's good to eat here? Oh, the lasagna is the best in town. Wait, why are you changing the subject? Don't you want to know who those guys are? No. I already know who they are. Carrington's mouth fell open. How? They're here for us. What? Who was Edward really? And why did he have the Secret Service following him around? Or whoever they were. Their security. The bald one is Jason, and the one with blonde hair is Charles. They're both from Estonia. I've known Charles for years. They're good men. There are men stationed outside your house as well. Carrington opened her mouth to protest, but he held up a finger. I know you think you can look out for yourself, but I'm not taking any chances with your safety. Don't you think this is a little over the top? You don't know who we're dealing with. The hostess led them to a booth. They got settled in, and the two men took the booth next to them. Are you sure this is really necessary? A server came up to their table. Can I get a glass of Merlot? please? And the calamari appetizer, Edward said. I'll have the same with a glass of water. She looked back at Edward. Who are you? He met her eyes evenly. I'm a painter. That's all you need to worry about. And something else, too, she intoned. Someone important. It figured. All her friends had gotten involved with high-profile men. Why would she be any different? You're not a vampire, are you? Because that would be just my luck. Edward chuckled. No. I'm fully human, I assure you. You haven't been bitten by a radioactive spider? He shook his head. I'm spider bite free. What about some kind of chemical spill? Carrington, there's nothing supernatural involved. I promise you. Just checking. You watch enough movies, and you start to wonder. Their server came back with their drinks and a basket of garlic bread. 
Carrington reached in and took a breadstick. She could practically taste the buttery garlic now. She bit into it and wasn't disappointed. It was everything she'd remembered it to be. This is excellent, Edward said around bites. I know. She finished chewing the last bite. Why do I love food so much? Thank goodness she had a great metabolism and loved running. Well, what do we have here? Carrington looked up into the familiar face of Mrs. Wheaton, smiling enthusiastically at them, like she'd just uncovered a great secret. She wore a floppy straw hat with orange flowers on it and clutched her purse to her chest. Great. Now the entire town would know they were out together. Next thing she would know, there would be rumors going around Maple Creek that she was dating the new guy in town. Even if there may have been some truth to it, she wasn't sure she wanted it to be common knowledge. Hello, Mrs. Wheaton, Carrington said. Fancy meeting you two here. And together. Mrs. Wheaton winked at him. I told you she was quite the catch. She clasped her hands, the skin under her arms swinging. I love it when I see love blossoming. I can always tell when two people are meant for each other. And I'm always right, aren't I, Walter? A tall, spindly man with thinning gray hair that stuck up in odd places appeared beside her. Yes, dear. His back was bent over, and he looked like he was in pain just standing there. He put up a hand like he was blocking his words from his wife. You learn after thirty years of marriage to give that response in most situations. It's best about ninety-five percent of the time. Mrs. Wheaton elbowed her husband, almost knocking him over. I heard that, Walter. I might be getting up there in age, but I'm not deaf. Edward, this is Mr. Wheaton. He was my high school chemistry teacher. It's a pleasure to meet you. I taught for 35 years. Carrington was a fine student. She would have been better if she'd taken notes instead of drawing so much during class. Carrington blushed. I'm afraid Mr. Wheaton's memory is still just as sharp as it ever was. Mrs. Wheaton leaned toward them, lowering her voice. Did you see those two men in the booth next to you? They look like bodyguards or something. I don't even see any of our more famous town citizens here today. Who do you suppose they're here for? Just what they needed. The entire town to start suspecting that Edward was more than just her dad's art student. Maybe they're just here to enjoy a nice meal. They could be off the clock. Hopefully that would deter her from digging deeper into the situation. Mrs. Wheaton patted her arm. You're probably right. Why didn't I think of that? Carrington felt the tension leave her shoulders. Unless, they're here for Edward. We don't really know much about him. He could be secretly famous, couldn't he? She turned to Edward, taking his face in her hands. This does look like the face of a celebrity. And this haircut. It looks awfully expensive. Not to mention the clothes he's wearing. She released his face with one hand and plucked at his starched shirt. This has to be from some European designer. You can't buy clothes like this in Maple Creek. Edward sat frozen under her scrutiny, like he wasn't sure what to do as she manhandled him. And have you heard the way he talks? Everything he says sounds fancy like he's speaking the lines from a storybook. She looked over to the security in the next booth over. Yes. They could definitely be here for Edward. Those are some highly interesting observations, Mrs. Wheaton, Edward said. I assure you, there are explanations for all your suspicions. Carrington folded her arms across her chest. She would love to hear all his explanations. Because Mrs. Wheaton was making some awfully good points. She'd noticed several of the same observations that Carrington had picked up on herself. Well, let's hear them, Sonny. Let the poor man alone. He doesn't owe you any explanations. Walter tugged on his wife's arm. His business is his own. She waved him off. Not now, Walter. I'm just getting to the bottom of this. Charles appeared beside them. Sir? Would you like us to remove these people? 
Mrs. Wheaton's eyes grew huge with fear as she took in the massive, intimidating man looming over her. Edward waved him off. The guard backed up and sat back down but seemed on edge like he was about to spring back to his feet at any moment. Edward cleared his throat and turned back to the nosy woman. I'm of the Mastonian nobility, Mrs. Wheaton. And yes, the security guards are here for me. Chapter 11 Carrington's eyes bulged, and Edward braced himself for her reaction. What? she sputtered. Well, that makes plenty of sense. Mrs. Wheaton looked delighted with the new information. To think we have the aristocracy right here in our midst. It's like a fairy tale come true. She was that excited, and she didn't even know his title. How would she act when she figured out he was a prince? You just couldn't leave the poor man alone, Mr. Wheaton scolded. Always digging into other people's business. I should be used to it after all these years. I don't know why I ever bother to stop you. It never does any good. Oh, Walter, calm down. It'll be just fine. Edward doesn't mind, do you, dear? He did mind, actually, but Mrs. Wheaton would probably figure him out eventually, anyway. If he'd been evasive with her, she probably would have been that much more eager to dig for information. Hopefully, Carrington wasn't too upset with him for hiding so much from her. Come on, Walter. Let's go. Just wait until I tell Margaret about this. She pulled on her husband's arm and dragged him from the restaurant. Edward breathed a sigh of relief. He was sure she would start digging next for what his title exactly was, but she seemed so excited with the fact that he was nobility that she hadn't thought to ask for more details. His relief didn't last long though. Carrington's face was red like she was furious with him. Your nobility? You didn't think that was an important detail to mention to me? I, uh. Is this why people are trying to take pictures of you? Are you part of a political uprising or something? I can't tell you too much. The less you know, the better. Carrington twisted her hands on the tabletop. This is so frustrating. I'm truly sorry. Why did you tell Mrs. Wheaton the truth when I've asked you repeatedly, and you wouldn't tell me a word? That's a good question. Because he hadn't told Mrs. Wheaton the full truth. But he couldn't exactly say that. She was getting too close to the truth. I couldn't think of anything else to say. That answer seemed to satisfy Carrington because she nodded slowly and relaxed her shoulders. Are those the responsibilities you were talking about back in Mastonia? The fact that you're nobility? Yes. Do you understand why I can't just abandon my country? Although, he was tempted. Carrington sighed. I get it. You shouldn't shirk your duties. It sounds like you have some pretty important stuff you need to do back there. I do. But I do love your small American town. I enjoy being here with you. There's something so uncomplicated and appealing about staying here and focusing on painting. So you're thinking about possibly staying? Was that hope lighting her eyes like she wanted him to stay here? The thought caused his heart to do a small flip in his chest. He hoped she wanted him nearby. That alone tempted him greatly to abandon his life in Mastonia. I can't deny that the thought has come into my mind. But you're not fully convinced that it's the best idea? I'm not, Edward agreed reluctantly. I guess I can understand that. It's a big decision to make. She had a sadness in her eyes that twisted his insides. He was starting to feel too much for this woman, and it was dangerous territory to enter. He couldn't predict what his heart would ask of him next. But every moment he spent with her was better than the next. He was always thinking of new ways to spend time with her. Between that and painting, he hardly thought of anything else when he wasn't avoiding his brother's men, anyway. An idea formed in his mind. It was crazy, but it could be fun. 
I would like to cook for you sometime, Edward said. Carrington blinked at him. You can cook? She sipped her wine, beautiful curls framing her face. He shrugged. How hard can it be? You've allowed me to try traditional southern food. I want to show you what food in Mastonia is like. That does sound interesting. When do you want to do it? I was thinking tomorrow night. That would give me time to get the ingredients. Don't you have servants who cook for you? I would think the nobility wouldn't cook for themselves. What kind of nobility are you, anyway? Like an earl or something? Or whatever the equivalent in Mastonia would be. Something like that. Oh, I see. You're being evasive again. Have it your way. At least she wasn't getting mad at him again for being so secretive. How much longer could he keep his identity confidential? I hope you won't try to look me up on the internet. I wouldn't do that. I don't go around digging up private information like that. When she discovered the truth, would she decide she wanted to be with him for his title? Edward had all the ingredients for meatballs, gravy, and homemade noodles lined up on his tiny kitchen counter. Carrington was supposed to be at his place in an hour. He peered at the internet article he'd pulled up with the recipe for Mastonian meatballs. After dumping the ground beef in a bowl with breadcrumbs, egg, and various spices, he started squishing the slimy, cold meat between his fingers. How disgusting. People liked to do this for fun. Edward suddenly had a greater appreciation for the palace kitchen staff. He kept mixing the ingredients with his hands, wishing he had a pair of gloves on. It would be a miracle if he ever got the particles of raw beef from under his fingernails. He formed them into balls and dumped them in a glass baking dish, but they stuck together. A quick glance at the recipe showed a picture of the meatballs spaced evenly. Frowning, he scooted them apart, but they kept sticking together. Finally, he got them separated, but now they weren't so round anymore. Some of them looked more like misshapen lumps. Edward put the dish in the oven. He was supposed to preheat the oven and hadn't. Keeping them in a little longer would make up for the time difference. Next, he mixed up the gravy. Quickly, lumps formed, and he couldn't figure out how to get rid of them. He growled in frustration. This was proving more difficult than he'd first imagined. Time was running out, and Carrington would be there soon. He scrambled to pull up the noodles recipe. When he'd looked up recipes, one suggested he use a package of pasta. But he wanted only the best for Carrington. He mixed the batter. The recipe said to roll it out, but there was nothing around to roll it with. He poured the watery mess onto the table and patted it with his hands instead. The dough stuck to the table, and he couldn't pull it off. What had he done wrong? He furrowed his brow as he glanced over the recipe. He'd missed the step where he was supposed to put flour down. How frustrating. The next step was to cut the dough and place the strips in a pot of boiling water, but he'd forgotten to get the pot ready. Banging around in the kitchen, he searched for a large pot but could only find a small one. It would have to work. Edward filled it with water and turned on the burner. He turned his attention back to the noodles scraped them off before placing them in the pot of water, but they looked like a big mess. The pot hadn't started boiling yet, but he was running out of time. Carrington was due to be there in five minutes. Maybe he should have bought the package of noodles, after all. Edward stirred the noodles, but they just turned into one big blob in the bottom of the pot. He used a spatula to break them apart again. They were lumpy, but it would still work. They'd go along great with his lumpy gravy. A knock sounded on his door, and he wiped off his hands on a paper towel and rushed to answer it. Carrington stood at the bottom of the cement staircase that led down to his humble basement apartment. You're staying here? She glanced around. I would have thought someone of noble blood would have found a big house to rent in town. I'm trying to keep a low profile. 
This is fine for what I need while I'm here. Hmm, okay. If you say so. If I was nobility, I'd pick out someplace nicer. He cleared his throat, hoping to get the focus off his rank. Dinner is almost finished. Can I bring you something to drink while you wait? That would be nice. What do you have available? Water, red wine, coke. I'll take a glass of wine. He went into the kitchen, which was a disaster, and found the bottle he'd bought for the occasion. At least, he'd thought of that. He'd spotted a set of wine glasses in a top cupboard earlier, and he retrieved one for her. Here, he said, bringing it to Carrington. Thank you. Do you need any help? She peered past him, toward the kitchen. No, no. I have it all handled, he insisted. Okay. I'll just hang out here then. She took a seat on the clean but simple sofa. Edward returned to the kitchen to check the timer to see when the meatballs would be finished but found it sitting at zero. He must have forgotten to set it. The noodles were boiling furiously and some of the lumps had stuck to the bottom. He fished as many as he could out with a slotted spoon and put them in a bowl. Everything is almost ready, he called to her. He looked over at the table. It was covered in dough from making the noodles. That still needed to be cleaned up. Do need some help? I'm happy to pitch in. No, no. Everything is going according to plan. Are you sure? Yes. I'm positive. Edward wiped off the table and found he had to scrub to get the dough off. The rag was covered in dough. After washing the table three times, he finally got all the residue clean. He set out plates and silverware. Then he brought out platters with the noodles and a bowl with the gravy. I just have to get the meatballs out of the oven. He opened the oven door and pulled the meatballs out. The extra time should have been helpful since he'd put them in before he'd preheated the oven. But when he peered inside, the meatballs looked dried out. Maybe they still wouldn't be too bad. He dumped them in the gravy, and the impact splashed all over his blue shirt. He looked down. He was also covered in flour from his fight with the noodles. What a disaster. Carrington giggled. He looked up to see her standing in the doorway. You've never cooked before, have you? His face heated up. No. How could you tell? She looked around the messy kitchen. Just an impression I got. They sat down to eat. He looked down at his grimy torso. Maybe I should change before we get started. That might be a good idea. He got up and rushed off to his bedroom and returned with a freshly pressed shirt he'd brought back from the dry cleaners that morning. Since he'd been in Maple Creek, he'd taken all his clothes to the dry cleaners, even his underwear. He didn't actually know how to do laundry, so he figured hiring it out would be the best way to get his clothes clean. It was the most like what he was used to in Mastonia. He got back to the table, and they filled their plates. This is a traditional Mastonian meal you might find in any typical household. It looks delicious. Usually the noodles aren't lumpy, and the gravy is smooth. But you can get the general idea. He bit into his food. The noodles were rubbery and tasteless. He'd forgotten to include salt in the recipe. And everything was cold. He'd taken so long to get it on the table and then he'd had to change his shirt, so it was no wonder. Carrington was chewing her food, but he could tell she didn't like it because she was chewing so slowly and she looked like she was in pain. Well, maybe the meatballs were okay. Edward stabbed one with his fork, but it was hard as a rock and his fork bounced off the surface. Forcing his fork into the misshapen mass, he finally made it through. He put it in his mouth and almost gagged. He'd used way too much garlic and must have used the tablespoon instead of the teaspoon. His eyes watered, and he wiped at them. He pushed his plate away. I'm sorry, Carrington. This food is terrible. 
It's not that bad. Yes, it is. It's disgusting. Yeah. You're right. It is. She couldn't hold back her giggle. Laughter bubbled up from inside him. Would you like to get a cheeseburger and a milkshake instead? Boy, would I ever. She jumped up from the table like she couldn't get out of there fast enough. Edward got up and followed her to the door. Let me get my keys, and I'll drive us. Chapter 12 I know the best place to get burgers, Carrington said as she buckled her seatbelt. She gave him directions to her favorite diner in town. As they drove through town, a heavy rain fell. Edward slowed down as the torrential downpour pelted them. Carrington groaned. This can't be good for the museum. We're going to need some tarps to protect the roof. Do you have access to tarps? No. We're going to need to buy some. Perhaps we can go to the hardware store after dinner to purchase some. That's not a bad idea. I'll have to get Ollie to put them up in the morning. I just hope the roof doesn't leak tonight. He pulled into the parking lot of the diner, and they ran inside, getting drenched. She laughed at the hair stuck to his forehead. We must look like a couple of drowned rats. It's only a bit of water. It won't hurt that much. Unless you're talking about a museum full of priceless artwork. Edward's expression sobered. Yes. I suppose water could do quite a bit of damage in that situation. It's a good thing you have these fundraisers coming up. Yes. The 5K is this weekend. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate for it. Have you checked the forecast? She pulled out her phone to look it up while someone came to show them to a table. It looks like sunshine. She let out a pent-up breath. The last thing they needed was bad weather ruining their race. It was one less issue to worry about. They ordered shakes, burgers, and fries, and Edward fed her some of his fries. She giggled. No offense, but this is way better than the dinner you cooked. He laughed. No offense, taken. Maybe, I ought to stick to eating out from now on. I could probably teach you a few things in the kitchen, if you wanted. I'd like that. I felt like I was way out of my depth when I attempted to cook dinner tonight. There was much more involved than I'd expected. Well, you didn't exactly pick an easy dinner to make. I haven't even tried to make homemade noodles and meatballs. I usually just buy the package of frozen meatballs and toss them in the oven. And noodles? I get the box from the grocery store. All you have to do is boil them. I want it to be as authentic as possible. I'm used to them being homemade. You probably have some chef cooking for you. Edward pressed his mouth into a firm line. So he wasn't going to give any information. Typical. She pushed down the irritation that threatened to surface. I'll take that as a yes. She shook her head. I don't even know what that would be like. We grew up in vastly different worlds. His voice held hesitation. You're struggling to even tell me that much, aren't you? I don't want to put you in danger. The men who are after us are serious criminals. I've already compromised you enough. Where are your security guys, anyway? Carrington looked around. They're in the booth in the corner. Oh. She twisted to look. Sure enough, they were sitting there, eating fries and watching them. I hadn't even noticed them. I have to say, it does feel a bit better knowing I'm being watched over, even though at first it was weird for me. You get used to it. Was this her future? Worrying that criminals were after her because of who she chose to spend time with? Did she have a future with Edward? Was that what she wanted? She didn't even know enough about him to know what a future with him in Mastonia would look like. And could she leave her museum and leave all the friends she'd ever have to follow a man halfway across the world? Carrington was getting ahead of herself. She didn't even know if Edward liked her enough to want her to follow him there. It wasn't surprising that her mind was already jumping to a life with Edward. 
It was typical for her to daydream about a guy and what their future might hold. She used to do it all the time with Bryant. Nothing ever came of it though. She needed to keep her mind grounded in reality, and Edward had a life to return to in another country and hadn't invited her to come along with him. She took a long sip of her chocolate shake, savoring every bit. She needed the sugar rush. Have you gotten used to it? she asked. The security? I'm used to that part. But being hunted down and having my life threatened is new to me. Your life is being threatened? Carrington's stomach churned. Does that mean my life is threatened too? Edward's mouth turned downward. I don't know. But I don't want to take any chances. That's terrifying. It's my fault. I feel like I've dragged you into this. Her voice went soft. What have you gotten yourself into? He gave a short laugh. I was born. And there's someone out there who doesn't like that. Apparently, my existence offends that person. You can't help it that you exist. I just can't figure out why someone would be mad at you for that. I can understand jealousy, but wanting to kill someone over it is taking it to a whole other extreme. What kind of nutcase is after you, anyway? A very serious, determined one. I just hope nothing happens to you because you're involved. Why would they want to hurt me? Because you've been seen with me. They may use you to get to me. You mean take me captive and then demand that you do something? That's one possibility. And there are a dozen others, I'm sure. I don't want to find out about any of them. What does that mean? It means I'm not taking any chances with your safety. That's why you're being watched over. She reached across the table and took his hand. Thank you. It's really sweet that you want to protect me. He turned his hand over and squeezed hers. Of course, I do. I'm not used to a guy caring this much. My dad cares, but I mean someone who isn't related to me. I do care about you. More than you know. Her heart sped up at his words. His hand was warm beneath hers, and she longed for him to put his arms around her and kiss her again. I care about you too, she whispered. It was hard to get those words out. Scary. Because just because Edward cared about her didn't mean he wanted to build a life with her. She couldn't know how seriously he meant it. She cared about plenty of people. It didn't mean she wanted to be with them romantically in a long-term relationship. Was that what she was looking for? Didn't she deserve the happiness so many of her friends had found? She wanted to voice her thoughts to Edward, tell him that she was looking for something real, but fear clutched at her heart. She couldn't bring herself to say the words. Should we get the check? Edward asked, interrupting her thoughts. She wiped her mouth on her napkin and tossed it on her plate. Yes. I'm ready to head over to the hardware store. Edward glanced out the window into the darkness. It looks like the rain is clearing up some. She peered out there herself. She could see in the light of a nearby lamppost that the heavy rain had dropped to a drizzle. Now's a good time for us to make our escape. Edward nodded over at the security team and then waved at the server for the check. He insisted on paying. Consider this a date. I promised you dinner anyway. After the bill was taken care of, they headed out into the wet night. Edward searched for local hardware stores and pulled up directions on his GPS to the nearest one. Carrington ran her fingers through her hair. It was starting to dry some. She probably looked awful. We must look ridiculous. Impossible. You look beautiful. My hair is a disaster though. She tucked an unruly strand behind her ear. There's nothing wrong with a bit of messy hair. Edward gave her a wicked grin. What's that smile supposed to mean? Nothing. I just don't mind seeing a messed up hairstyle on the woman I'm into, especially if there's a good reason for it. Like if a good time was had. You're such a man. Women don't like their hair messy. His words sunk in a moment later. Wait, were you trying to say you're into me? 
he couldn't mean seriously. Man didn't take her seriously. Edward glanced over at her, brows raised. You haven't picked up on that yet? Her cheeks flushed. I mean, you did want to kiss me, so I guess it would make sense. But he probably kissed lots of girls. It didn't necessarily mean anything. Not the way she wanted it to. She always wanted more from a relationship than the other person. They pulled into the parking lot of the hardware store and headed into the building. Hopefully, the rain wouldn't pick up again. Getting those tarps up as soon as possible was top priority. They walked past rows of tools until they found the aisle with the tarps. How many do you think we'll need? Edward looked at the package and studied the square footage on it. How many square feet is the museum? They calculated it up and loaded the cart with tarps. We should go by the museum tonight and make sure nothing has dripped on the artwork, Carrington suggested as they headed to the register. I mean, if you want to come along, that is. He looked right into her eyes, his own softening. My evening is yours. The way he said it made her heart flip-flop in her chest and a shiver run down her spine. She cleared her throat. Um, okay then. They approached the register and got in line behind an older couple with some fall plants from the garden center in their cart. Did you know this is my first time in a hardware store? Edward admitted. Don't you have hardware stores in Mastonia? Yes, but I never had a reason to go in one. That seemed hard to believe. You never did a home improvement project with your grandfather? We had workers keeping up with those sorts of projects. I guess that makes sense, you being nobility and all. It's just such a different world than what I'm used to. I don't think it's really sunken that your life was so extremely different from mine. Edward's expression sobered. I hope that won't be a problem for you. What did he mean by that? Was he hinting that he wanted to be with her or something? Carrington shook off the errant thought. Of course, he didn't mean that. Her mind was racing off into the sunset with possibilities like she always did when she crushed on someone. She had to keep her feet on the ground before her mind took things too far. Why should it be a problem? It's not like we're planning a relationship or anything. I mean, you're heading back to Mastonia before too long anyway, right? She winced at her own words. Maybe she was being too assumptive. Edward's spine stiffened. You're right. I will most likely be going back to Mastonia. Had she said the wrong thing? The mood between them had suddenly shifted. An ache formed in her heart. Why did she have to want him to want her so badly? But the longer she spent with him, the more she wanted the next moments to be by his side. He was funny, charming, and smart. He was deeply interested in her work and gave great suggestions. She could see herself with him one day. They would make a great team working at the museum. She couldn't bear to think about him going back to Mastonia. She'd gotten used to him coming over every morning to work with her dad. Is that what you've decided? she asked gently. I haven't decided anything. The threat hasn't passed, so I'm staying here in Maple Creek until it's safe to return. My time here is valuable to me as well. I'm learning a lot from your father. I couldn't get this level of training in Mastonia. Your father's technique is quite unique. Right. He was here for her dad. Not her. She sure liked to let her imagination run wild. But why did hearing that he wasn't in Maple Creek for her have to hurt so much? I'm glad things are going well with your training. I've already seen leaps in my progress as an artist. It's been quite astounding, really. I can't believe you came all this way to learn from my dad. I mean, I know he's amazing, but still. He's still just my dad to me. It's a wonder that your father has been largely undiscovered. His paintings should be shown across the world. They stepped up the register, and Edward took the tarps from the cart and set them on the counter. I was surprised to hear that one of his paintings had made it as far as Mastonia. If it were up to me, his artwork would be shown all across my country. Well, you're a nobleman, right? 
maybe you could make it happen. I mean, not that I'm pushing for you to promote my dad's work like that, but if you wanted it to be known, could you make it happen? I don't know much about how all that works. Carrington swiped her card to pay for the tarps and took the bags from the cashier, who looked at them with wide eyes. She probably didn't hear conversations like this one every day. Edward hesitated before he spoke. I could probably have some pull, yes. Well, you have that experience with the museum you worked with. Yes. I have many contacts there. We've built a strong friendship. Then you could convince them to feature some of his art, right? I just think it would be so cool to have his artwork in a national museum like that. His paintings are some of the finest contemporary art I've encountered. It would be an honor for the museum in Macedonia to feature his work. Excitement bubbled through Carrington. This could be huge for her dad. He'd worked his entire life for a moment like this. And he didn't even know the pull his own student had to bring his work into the limelight. Carrington hadn't told him Edward was nobility. But with the gossip mill of Maple Creek doing its job, it wouldn't be long before he found out. She couldn't deny that she was even more attracted to Edward, knowing he was nobility. There was something so swoony about that. Like she was living her own real-life fairy tale. The problem was, she wasn't sure fairy tales ever came true for her. Chapter 13 Edward drove Carrington back to his place to pick up her car, and then they went to the museum to check for damage. There were some drips running down the walls. He helped her get the ladder, and he climbed up to dry off the wet spots. So far, nothing had damaged any of the paintings, although there were a few close calls. They left the tarps in the utility closet for her handyman to find the following morning. He walked Carrington to her door. The rain had all but stopped. When they reached her front porch, he brushed her hair back from her face. He cupped his hand around her chin and leaned down to place a kiss on her sweet lips. She smelled like fresh-cut flowers blooming in the spring and tasted sweet as honey. He slid his hand to the back of her neck and tangled his hand in her wild locks. He loved how messy it had gotten after getting wet and drying on its own. There was something wild and untamed about it that lit a primal feeling inside him. He pulled her closer and kissed her more deeply. She stood on tiptoes and wrapped her arms around his neck. She pulled away an inch. I really like this. Me too. He went in for another kiss on her soft lips. Couldn't this last forever? How could he ever part from this beautiful woman before him? You're a lovely woman, he said between kisses. I care so much about you. I care about you too. She pulled away. Was that fear in her eyes? I have to go. But why? He didn't want to part with her. Saying goodnight would half kill him. He released his hold on her reluctantly. Sleep well, beautiful. Good night. She disappeared into the house. Had he said something wrong? If she was acting skittish now, how would she feel when she found out the truth that he was actually the crown prince of Mastonia? It was only a matter of time before she heard. When he returned to his apartment, he saw a commotion near his basement entrance. Jason and Charles were searching around his house, guns drawn. Ramsey's men must have followed him to his apartment at some point. He stayed in his car and immediately called Carrington. Hello? Are you safe? Yeah. Why do you ask? I just pulled up to my house, and my security forces are searching the premises with their guns out. I think they may have seen someone one sneaking around. Are you serious? Are you okay? I'm fine. He peered out the window. But it looks like a window might be broken on my front door. It's a good thing we decided to go out to eat. If we hadn't, they might have broken into your place while we were there. That's a chance I can't take, Edward said. This is getting more serious than I'd expected. 
it's a good thing you got those security guards to show up. I agree. Have you told your father the situation? Yes. He knows there are guards watching our house. We don't understand everything, of course, but we know to be on the lookout for suspicious activity. I'm going to text you the number of the agents who are outside your home. If you see anything or hear anything strange, reach out to them. Thanks, Edward. She was silent for a moment. This is all so frightening. He wished he could sleep over on her couch to watch over her, but that might just bring the danger right to her door. He hated it that he couldn't protect her. His father had assured him that these men were the best, but it wasn't the same as being able to watch over her himself. Edward's voice grew soft. I'm sorry you've gotten involved. I feel responsible. It's not your fault. Those men chose to come after you. Yes, but I knew I was in danger, and I still put your family at risk for my own selfish reasons. It's in the past now. I'm glad you did because now I know you. Her words warmed his heart. Despite everything, I'm glad I know you as well. She was quiet for a moment, and the silence hung heavily between them. Is everything okay with you? he asked. You appeared distant when I left. Carrington sighed. I care about you, but this is scary for me. Why are you afraid? Because of what I've been feeling. She hesitated before speaking again. I'm worried that my feelings are much stronger than yours. I can assure you, that's completely impossible. I'm struggling to believe that's true. Then give me the chance to show you it's true. Can you do that at least? She was silent for a moment. When she spoke again, her voice was quiet. I can try. His heart clenched. He was starting to fall deeper for this woman. Hearing the vulnerability in her voice made him want to envelop her in his arms and tell her that all would be well. Has someone hurt you before? He didn't know he was hurting me, but yes. What happened? I fell for someone who only had eyes for another woman. It made me wonder if I was unlovable. I couldn't figure out what I'd done wrong. Nothing changed his perspective, no matter how hard I tried. He just kept focusing on her. That sounds terribly painful. I'm sorry you went through that. Carrington sighed. It's in the past now. I'm over him. But it's just hard to imagine that another relationship could go differently for me. Edward was taking a risk by speaking his next words. I don't know how you feel about me but I'm falling for you. So unless you don't feel that way about me also, it would be very easy to imagine a relationship between us going quite differently. Carrington was silent for a moment. Really? She asked in a quiet voice. Yes. I hear what you're saying, but it's like my heart can't quite accept it. I'm still so scared. Take the time you need. I'm not in a rush. We can take it slow if that's what you need. I know you don't know everything about me. I understand your hesitation. Thank you, she whispered into the phone. Jason knocked on Edward's car window. One of my security guards needs to speak with me. Can we talk tomorrow? Sure. Are you going to the race? Yes. I was planning to run in it. That seemed to cheer her up. Her voice turned brighter. Awesome. I'll see you then. He ended the call and stepped out to greet the guard. We spotted someone attempting to break into your apartment. Charles went after him, but by the time I was able to get close, he'd already gotten away. We've called the local authorities to keep them informed on the situation. Do you know what the intruder's intentions were? Police lights flashed in the distance as the authorities approached. What did the intruder look like? Was it the same guy who tried to take his picture? Bald with a long, unruly beard, Jason said. So not the same man. 
That meant there was more than one man looking for him. Was he able to get inside? He broke the window on your front door, but we startled him before he could get any farther. We will have some of our men repair the window first thing tomorrow morning. He was safe for now, but those men were still out there. Edward showed up to race bright and early. After all the early morning runs he'd done, he felt prepared for the 5K. Lately, Jason and Charles had accompanied him to ensure his safety. As he drove into the parking lot, he spotted a familiar vehicle. A cold vice gripped his heart, and his breath caught. It was a black Honda Accord, the same kind of car the photographer had jumped into. He parked and then walked toward the vehicle with Jason and Charles trailing behind him. This is the same vehicle the photographer was in, he told them. Checking the license plate against the numbers he'd recorded in the notes in his phone, revealed the first few numbers were the same. His men searched the area, and they found no trace of anyone suspicious. I recommend you leave the area and return to safety, Jason said. No, no. I think it will be fine. We'll just be extra careful today. I promised Carrington I'd run, and I've trained weeks for this event. We'll keep a close eye on him, Charles said. They approached the table where Carrington sat with the other race organizers. She had the t-shirts with her art design of the mountain spread across the table. Her face lit up when she saw him. Edward. You made it. Are you ready for this? As ready as I possibly could be. She looked beautiful with her hair back in a ponytail. A couple of strands had fallen loose around her face. She had on a tank top and yoga pants. He wasn't used to seeing her dressed so casually. Unless he counted the time he knocked into her when she was only wearing a towel. Or the day at the picnic when she changed into an old t-shirt. He loved seeing her in athletic clothes. Do you enjoy running? He asked her. I don't know if I'd say I enjoy it, but I like to run so I can enjoy whatever foods I want. Would you like to go running with me in the mornings? Her smile brightened. I would love that. Do you just run around your neighborhood? Yes. I use the streets around my home. His heart sped up at the thought of Carrington running beside him. He pictured them going out for coffee afterwards, maybe snuggling up and kissing with their drinks between them. He wanted to spend every spare moment with this amazing woman. How was he so lucky to find a woman who cared about him and supported his interest in art? Well, maybe we can meet up tomorrow morning. I'd love that. Edward glanced back at his security force. He waved them back with two fingers. He didn't need them to overhear what he was about to say. They both stepped back to a respectful distance. Carrington. His heart raced as he contemplated what he was going to say next. He kept his voice lowered. I've decided to stay in Maple Creek. I can't bear to leave you, and I can't ask you to give up your life with your museum. Her brows drew together. Are you sure? Yes. I care for you deeper than you know. A life in Mastonia would be empty without you. What about your responsibilities there? There are others who can take over those duties. A conflicted expression flitted over Carrington's face. I feel like you'd be giving up too much for me. It's my decision. And I choose you. Carrington looked past him, her brows drawing together. The race is starting. You'd better get over there. We'll talk more about this later. He said goodbye reluctantly to Carrington and got into place, with Jason and Charles close behind him. He took off running with the rest of the race participants. The race took a route down a windy road that cut through the trees. Thick forests grew on either side of the street. His men followed close behind him. He turned a bend. The racers had thinned out. Only two runners were visible before him. The rest had disappeared beyond the curve in the road up ahead. The woods were eerily quiet, 
save for the sound of feet hitting the pavement and his breath, and the hair rose on Edward's arm. But all the birds and bugs had gone silent. Something was wrong. Two shots fired from the woods to his right. Heart racing, he sprinted forward. The two people in front of him screamed and stopped running, covering their hands over their heads. Go! Go! Edward shouted to them. Just keep running. You're not safe here. They listened to him and darted down the road. Three more shots went off, one of them whizzing just past Edward. He ran off into the trees across the street to get cover. He tucked his body behind a wide oak trunk, his breath coming in rapid spurts. Jason and Charles shouted, and he heard them racing toward the shooter. He glanced around the tree and spotted them across the street in the woods, guns drawn as they tracked down the shooter. Adrenaline rushed through Edward's veins. What if one of his men was shot because Ramsey was after him? He wasn't sure he could live with that. He stayed pressed up against the tree, listening to the sounds of them racing through the trees in the distance. His phone rang in his pocket. It was Charles. There's no trace of him, your highness. What? How could he have gotten away? He vanished into the woods. I'm calling the authorities, Jason said in the background. Yes. We've had shots fired. Jason gave his location. The shooter got away. We tried tracking him, but he disappeared into the woods. Edward couldn't slow his heart. What if there were men after Carrington as well? He felt so helpless stranded out in the woods. I need to make a phone call. Okay, Charles said. Stay where you are. We'll be there to find you in just a moment. He hung up and immediately made another call. Carrington? Hey, Edward. Why are you calling me instead of running? We had shots fired in the middle of the race. They were coming from the woods. What? Shock reverberated throughout her words. My guards weren't able to capture him. He got away. They called the police. I'm going to stay here with them. I'm so worried about you. I appreciate that, but are you okay? Have you seen anything out of the ordinary? No. Everything is fine here. I think I'm going to see if my father can send more men. This time, it was only one shooter. Who knows how many there will be next time. I'm friends with the chief of police. His wife runs the flower shop that's one of the museum's sponsors. I'll see if he can spare more men as backup. Good. I'm getting a gun and a concealed carry permit, Carrington said. I'm going to sign up for the ladies' firearms class that the police department offers. I feel like I need to know how to protect myself. Edward had been trained on how to use a gun himself by the Mastonian army. I think that's a great idea. It would help him sleep better at night, knowing she could protect herself. I hope your dad can send more men. The bad news is the police are probably going to shut down the race. We already have some people finishing up. I don't know how the cops are going to be able to notify all those people in the middle of the race that it's not safe for them. They'll just have to do their best. He just hoped that would be enough. Edward didn't want to be responsible for anyone getting hurt. He'd brought violence to this small town. It was imperative that they caught these killers. The sooner the better. Chapter 14 Did you hear that there was a shooting at the race? Carrington overheard Mrs. Wheaton say to her daughter. Aubrey and Mrs. Wheaton had volunteered to pass out drinks to the runners. The police should be here any minute. What? Aubrey said. In Maple Creek? Nothing like that ever happens here. Mrs. Wheaton leaned in like she was sharing a huge secret. I heard they were shooting at Edward. Why would anyone want to hurt Edward? Aubrey asked. Well, as the Crown Prince of Mastonia, I'm sure he has enemies. Had she heard them right? 
She turned to look at Mrs. Wheaton. What did you say? I said Edward probably has enemies because he's the crown prince of Mastonia. That's what I thought you said. How could you possibly know that? Aubrey waved her phone at Carrington. We looked him up. It wasn't that hard to find out who Edward was after he told my mom he was nobility. His pictures are all over the internet. Carrington had been tempted to look Edward up multiple times, but she had given him her word that she wouldn't. But it wouldn't matter at this point, since his secret was out. She pulled out her own phone and searched for Edward, Prince of Mastonia. Sure enough, dozens of pictures of Edward appeared, looking perfectly royal next to the king and queen. So this was the duty he was talking about. He was next in line to rule. She scanned through a few articles. There were even pictures of him with Elizabeth. Apparently, they'd been a hot couple, and then she'd betrayed him for his brother. It had been a huge scandal. How had she not heard about any of this? Probably because Mastonia was such a small country. The betrayal hit her, hard and ugly. All this time, he'd kept this from her. His secret wasn't just any small thing. This was huge. She scoured the internet for a clue about who was attacking him, but she came up with nothing, and no one seemed to notice that he wasn't at home. Are you okay, sweetheart? Mrs. Wheaton was studying her. That was when Carrington realized she was crying. Tears streamed down her cheeks. How could he keep something like this from you? Aubrey said, putting her hands on her hips. Carrington wiped at her tears and sniffled. He told me it wasn't safe for me to know his identity. Well, that would make sense, Aubrey pointed out. He was just shot at. Carrington sniffled. But I think he had another reason too. What's that? Aubrey asked. I think he was afraid I would go after him just for his crown. Aubrey's eyes widened. Out. You really think he thought that of you? Carrington nodded. He said his old girlfriend only wanted him for shallow reasons. I bet she was after his title. That blonde girl? What was her name, like Elizabeth or something? I saw a picture of him with her online. Yeah. The one who looks like a supermodel. I'm so stupid to think he would ever take me seriously. Nonsense, Mrs. Wheaton said. You're every bit as gorgeous as that other woman. Even more beautiful, if you ask me. At least you aren't fake looking. But the part that matters is that you're a good person. Elizabeth cheated on him with his brother. She's not trustworthy, and you are. I don't know if he believes that. Now that I know his real identity, he's probably going to drop me. Why would you say that? Aubrey asked. Because things like this don't happen to me. Guys don't take me seriously. Then there are a bunch of fools, Mrs. Wheaton said, her gray eyebrows drawing together in determination. You're an amazing catch. Any man would be lucky to have you, even a prince. A realization dawned on her. Edward said he wanted to stay in Maple Creek, but I can't let him do that. He has a responsibility to the throne. He can't throw all that away from me. And that meant he would go back to Mastonia without her. The recognition of that fact left a gaping hole in the middle of her. Somehow, along the way, she'd fallen hard for him, a prince. Wasn't that every girl's daydream? It was too good to be true. What did she know about running a kingdom, anyway? She was a small-town girl from Virginia and hadn't been prepared to be with a prince. She needed lessons or something, right? He'd probably been trained from birth to become king one day. How could she be a good match for someone like that? Edward came jogging up to her with Jason and Charles trailing behind. He reached out and took her in his arms. I'm so glad you're okay. She stiffened beneath his embrace. Edward, we need to talk. Walk with me. He slid to the side, keeping one arm around her shoulders. Can you watch the table? she asked Aubrey. Of course, you know I got you, girl. She winked at Carrington. 
they began walking, and his men kept a respectful distance behind them. When they were out of earshot, she said to Edward, So you're the crown prince of Mastonia. He stopped walking and turned to her. You know. How? Mrs. Wheaton and her daughter did research on the internet and told me just now. I looked it up myself and saw it was true. I see. His face was white. I asked you not to look me up. I figured it didn't matter at this point. The truth was already out. Edward sighed. I suppose you're right. I knew you would eventually find out. It was only a matter of time. You can't settle down here, Edward. You can't abandon your country. I didn't know you were the heir to the throne when you told me you wanted to stay in Maple Creek. This changes everything. I can't be responsible for you abandoning your birthright. You have an entire country counting on you. I can't compare with that. It's my choice. And it's the wrong one. I won't be part of it. Anger boiled up inside her as she thought again about the betrayal of him keeping such a big secret from her. Why didn't you just tell me yourself that you were the crown prince? I would have much rather heard it from you. Edward sighed. I didn't want you to get more involved than you already were. And is that the only reason? Carrington suspected it wasn't. What are you trying to ask? Were you afraid that I would want you for your title? Edward looked back at her, eyes wide. Are you going to answer me? I cannot deny I was worried about that. Carrington folded her arms across her chest. So you think I'm that kind of person? Like your ex? That's just great. I... I'm not sure I can be with you if you're going to think so lowly of me. She shook her head. You don't know me at all, do you? His shoulders slumped. Are you ending things with me? I think that would be best, don't you? No. Of course not. I want to be with you, Carrington. But I can't be with you. For so many reasons. You need to go back to Mastonia. I'm distracting you from your duties to the crown. The other reason she didn't state aloud. She felt out of her depth. It was all too much. How could she be with a prince? Talk about intense pressure. She hadn't even been able to handle a relationship with a regular guy. She couldn't try out a relationship with a prince under the public eye. Not to mention that someone wanted to kill Edward. Would they try to kill her too? Don't do this, Carrington. Please. We'll figure everything out. We don't have to find all the answers today. Fear swirled around her. It was too much. She needed to get away. I have to go. She turned and fled the scene. Over the next few weeks, she avoided Edward as much as possible. She'd been able to sign up for the ladies' firearms class and had completed the two-week course. Once she'd graduated, she went out and bought a little gun to keep in her purse. Thanksgiving came and went. She'd spend it quietly with her dad and met up with Soraya the next day to go Black Friday shopping. When she got back to work Monday morning, she threw herself into planning the gala with Ellie. Ollie had long since gotten all the tarps on the roof, and thankfully, none of the paintings had been damaged. She couldn't avoid seeing Edward in the mornings from time to time, until she decided to start going to her office early so she was gone before he arrived. She stayed late at the museum so he was gone by the time she got home. Although it was her choice to avoid him, she longed to see him again, to have him hold her in his arms and stoke her hair back from her face. One day, while she was getting ready to take her lunch break, she got a call from Soraya. Hello? Okay, girl, Soraya said in a no-nonsense voice. What gives? What do you mean? Sully and Aubrey, tell me you've been detached and depressed for weeks. What happened with you and Edward? It didn't work out, she said in a flat voice. Are you free for lunch? I was just about to go grab some food. Why don't I come over there with something to eat? We can hang out in your office, and you can tell me what happened with this guy. That's fine. 
Have you tried the new chicken salad sandwich from Hadley's? Soraya asked. No. It's to die for. I'll bring us both one. She hung up with Soraya and returned to her work. It wasn't long before Soraya showed up with bags of food in her hands. I got you lemonade. Sorry, I forgot to ask you what you wanted to drink. Lemonade is great. Thanks. She took the cup from her friend. Here's your sandwich. Soraya handed her one of the bags. Thanks. Carrington took it from her. Soraya settled down in one of the chairs across from Carrington's desk and opened her sandwich. So what's going on with Edward? I was right before. He was hiding a big secret from me. Soraya's face darkened. Please don't tell me he's married. Carrington shook her head. No. He's the crown prince of Mastonia. Soraya's mouth fell open. Wait, what? You're joking, right? No. I'm dead serious. Soraya's eyes lit up. Well, that's a good surprise. She scrunched her brows together like she was confused as she tried to work through the details. But why was he keeping it a secret? He says it's because he didn't want me getting hurt by the people coming after him. Why do I get the impression that you don't believe that? Because I think he kept it from me because he didn't trust me to know the truth. He thought I'd want him for his title only. Her heart hurt just to think about it. Out. Exactly. I mean, what kind of social climber does he think I am? I'm not that kind of person at all. I like him for who he is inside. And you liked him before you knew he was a prince. If anything, the fact that he's a prince would have kept me from getting close to him if I'd known up front. Soraya tilted her head. Why do you say that? She took a bite of her sandwich. Because I would have assumed he wouldn't want to date a regular girl like me. Plus, it's intimidating. I get the intimidating factor. Being married to a billionaire is like that sometimes. I felt that way in the beginning with Kane, too. I worried I wouldn't measure up to the other girls surrounding him at the elite New York parties he goes to. It would be even worse dating someone who's royalty. They have so many rules and expectations. Talk about scary. What if he tried to bring me home to Mastonia, and I made a complete fool of myself in front of his family? I mean, I've seen the crown. It wasn't easy for Princess Diana, and she was already raised as nobility. I'm not even from his country. If you truly care about this guy, wouldn't all that be worth it? Wouldn't you be willing to step out of your comfort zone for someone you love? You do love him, don't you? I don't know. Soraya looked at her with a serious expression. Well, how are you doing without him? I'm miserable. I've never been so depressed in my entire life. A smile broke across Soraya's face. It sounds like you're in love to me. I'd be just as bad off if I couldn't be with Kane. Was she in love with Edward? A flush crept across her cheeks. She longed to hold him, to have him ask her to go back to Mastonia with him, even if it meant she had to face her fears and feel scrutinized by the royal family. But could she trust that he really, truly wanted to be with her like that? Would her fantasy actually become reality? I'm not sure he actually takes me seriously. What makes you say that? He hasn't asked me to go back to Mastonia with him. He said he wants to live in Maple Creek, but I can't let him abandon his birthright for me. But what if he doesn't want to bring me back to his parents because I wouldn't measure up? Have you talked to him about you going to Mastonia? Well, no. Then maybe he thinks you wouldn't want to leave your home and your father. Not to mention the museum. That could be true. I hadn't thought about that. You need to let him know you'd be willing to uproot and move for him, Soraya said. I guess I can do that. But it would be scary to let him know how strongly she felt about him. But what if he doesn't want to bring me to Mastonia? I mean, I don't know if he feels the same about me. You're going to have to put yourself out there a bit. That's part of the deal. It's risky 
but the payoff of a life with the man you love is worth that risk, right? Carrington pictured herself by Edward's side for years to come. Him showing her around his beautiful country, eating dinners together, painting side by side, working with the museum in Mastonia, maybe even welcoming children into the world. All that could be hers if she took a risk and allowed herself to do something scary. Meeting his family would be terrifying, but if Edward truly wanted her by his side, it would all be worth it. There's one more problem, though. What's that? Soraya asked. What if his family doesn't approve of me? I'm not exactly of noble birth. What if they forbid him to marry me? They liked Elizabeth because she came from the right family. I read all about it online. That's a very real possibility. But if he's worth being with, he'll fight for you. And once his parents see you for the woman you are, they'll love you. Carrington's heart warmed at her best friend's words. Thanks, girl. That means a lot. She just hoped Edward saw her that way too. Chapter 15 After grabbing lunch, Edward stopped by the small wedding dress shop to purchase his tuxedo for the gala. Richard had recommended the place. Hi. You must be Edward. A blonde woman greeted him. My name is Onyx, and I'm a friend of Carrington's. I have your tux ready. It's in the back. Give me just one moment to grab it for you. Thank you. Onyx disappeared into the back room. Edward looked around at all the white dresses. He couldn't help but picture Carrington airing one of them. But it hadn't seemed to work out between them. He hadn't seen her in weeks. She'd been heavily avoiding him and had failed to return his calls and texts. Onyx came back out with his tux. She hung it up on a rack next to the register. Are you excited for the gala next week? Yes. I hope it will be a great success. You're so sweet to help Carrington with it. I don't know that I've been as much help as I'd hoped. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. She told me the entire thing was your idea. My husband and I are huge fans of the museum. We're planning to come to support Carrington. She should have done something like this a long time ago. I've been telling her for years she needed to do more fundraising, but I guess her dad wasn't so excited about the idea. She rang him up, and he paid her. I was surprised when I heard you were able to talk her dad into finally allowing fundraising for the museum. He shrugged. I don't know that I did that much. What you did was huge. That museum won't last long without a roof. Carrington's lucky to have you around. Are you planning to stay in Maple Creek long? She reached out for the tux and handed it to him. He took the tux from her. I hope to stay here for some time, but Carrington doesn't support the idea. Onyx cocked her head to the side. Why not? She thinks I have too many responsibilities at home. Oh, yes. I heard you're the prince over there. So that's understandable. Onyx tapped her lips and narrowed her eyes like she was trying to decide something. This may be a bit nosy of me, but I can't help but ask. Are you dating Carrington? I'm not. There may have been something between us at one time, but I'm afraid it didn't work out between us. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that. You two would have been so great together. There aren't many guys around here who love art as much as Carrington. It's true we have a lot in common. Onyx gave him a stern look and put her hands on her hips. I sure hope you didn't break her heart. I've never seen Carrington with a guy before. We were all so excited when we heard from Aubrey that she was dating you. I believe it's the other way around. She's the one who left me with the broken heart. He wouldn't have normally shared so much with a stranger, but this woman seemed to already know the situation, and she seemed so easy to talk to that the words just spilled from his mouth. Onyx shot up her eyebrows. Why would she do something like that? 
Edward shifted his weight from one foot to the other. I most likely deserved it. I withheld my identity from her because I worried she might chase after me for my title. Carrington wouldn't ever do that. If you think that of her, then you don't know her very well. I know that now, but I had a bad experience with women in the past only wanting me for the crown. I can understand that. But you should have known better than to put Carrington in the same category as those shallow women, she scolded. I've been sufficiently chastised. You'd better make it up to her. If you're as heartbroken as you say you are, then you'll know Carrington is worth fighting for. It's a bit difficult to fight for someone who won't speak to you. Have you tried apologizing? Multiple times, but she never responds. Carrington's a stubborn girl. You may have to take some extra measures to get her attention. Onyx gave him a wide grin. The tux is a good start. Most girls can't resist a man who dresses up. He'd been well acquainted with that fact. Every time he'd attended a black tie function, he'd received plenty of female attention. That was how he'd met Elizabeth. Thinking of her betrayal left a sour taste in his mouth. I'll do my best to win her back. Thank you for the advice. You just need to sweep her off her feet. You're a prince. Surely you can handle that, right? He'd been trained on how to charm women, but when he thought about facing Carrington, his mouth went dry and his palms dampened. He said goodbye to Onyx and headed back to the Dalton's cottage to resume his work for the day. Hello, he called when he entered the home. Richard came out from the studio. Ready to get back to work? They'd been working on their brush strokes earlier that morning. Did you get your tux for the gala? Richard asked. Yes. I spoke with the owner of the shop. She said she's friends with Carrington. Onyx and Carrington have been close for years. Onyx refers her wedding dress customers to Carrington to book our venue quite often. She's sent a lot of money our way. He led the way back to his studio. Speaking of Carrington, are the two of you upset with each other? He glanced over his shoulder at Edward. Edward swallowed. Why do you ask? She seems withdrawn. I tried asking her about it, but she won't tell me anything. I've noticed that you stopped spending time with her and thought the two might be connected. Withdrawn? Did that mean she was heartbroken as well? Was she just as miserable as he was? Yes, she's been downright depressing to be around, always moping about. Richard studied him. Come to think of it, you haven't seemed that happy lately either. He poked a finger into Edward's chest. Something's going on between the two of you. I just know it. Edward sighed and sat in the chair in the corner of the room. I've fallen in love with your daughter. But it didn't work out between us. Why not? You're the first decent guy to come around. I want grandchildren one day, and there hasn't been any hope of that before now. Grandchildren? Edward gulped. Did he mind if they were royalty? Did Carrington tell you my situation? She said you were the Prince of Mastonia and that someone was trying to take your life. She didn't seem happy that you kept that from her. I thought it was safest for her that way. But she's been in danger just being around me. I haven't done the greatest job keeping her safe. He hung his head in shame. She's just fine. Weeks have gone by, and she's had no harm come to her. But it could be the calm before the storm. There was no way Ramsay was just giving up. They hadn't caught his men. For now. Who is after you, anyway? It's my brother. He wants the throne. Why are you here in Maple Creek instead of fighting for what's rightfully yours? I came here to hide from his assassins. But they know you're here now. Why stay? I've stayed here to paint and learn from you. You almost know everything I do at this point. There's nothing left for you here, unless you're planning on proposing to my daughter. 
I don't think she'd have me. She told me she doesn't want me to abandon my birthright and stay in Maple Creek. And I don't think she'd leave her museum. Not for me. Have you asked her to go to Mastonia with you? Well, no. Then how do you know what she wants? I just assumed. You can never make assumptions with women. You have to be open with them. Communication is key. Richard dipped his paintbrush in a cool blue and swiped it across the canvas. And I agree with Carrington. You can't stay here. You have to return to your country, but you should ask her how she would feel about going there with you. If that's what you want, anyway. You wouldn't object to her being so far away. Of course, I want my daughter by my side. It would break my heart to have her so far away. But it wouldn't be right for you to let down an entire country. I want to have her there. I love her, and I can't imagine another woman by my side. Richard looked over at him, a serious expression on his face. Then you'd better ask her to marry you. I don't want to see any man string my daughter along. Edward blinked at his mentor's blunt language. Do you think she would say yes? To the man she's in love with? I would assume so. If she's in love with me, then why has she been avoiding me? He waved a hand in the air dismissively. Because she's caught up on some silly thing. I know my daughter well. She probably thinks she's not worthy of you. Not worthy of me? That's ridiculous. She's completely my equal in every way. You're a prince. She may not see it that way. But that doesn't matter to me. I don't want a woman who wants me for my title. I'd rather be with someone like Carrington who sees me for me and accepts my flaws. You need to tell her you feel that way. How? She's always avoiding me. She lives here. Stay for dinner tonight. Talk with her. She can't escape you if you're at her house. You're my guest tonight. I'll order us pizza. Okay, I accept. He only hoped the night didn't turn out to be a disaster. Edward's heart pounded harder the closer it came to dinner time. Richard left to go pick up some pizzas, and Edward stayed behind to wait for Carrington. He hoped she didn't turn around and walk out of the house when she saw him. He'd been trained to be in difficult political situations, but he was completely out of his depth tonight. How could he maneuver correctly with Carrington? Would he say the wrong thing and push her further away? He paced the living room floor, running his hands through his hair. The doorknob twisted, and he dropped his hands to his sides. Carrington stood in the opening, framed by the evening rays. Her hair glowed around her like a red halo. Hello, Edward. He stood in place. Hello. It was all he could think to say. She wasn't smiling. I wasn't expecting you to still be here, she said in a flat tone. You sound happy to see me. Maybe being sarcastic wasn't the best approach. She closed the door behind her. Your father invited me to stay for pizza. Oh. Was that all she could say? This evening was getting off to a fantastic start. How have you been? Good, she said. Was that ice in her voice? She slipped her coat off and hung it up in the closet next to the door. Do you feel ready for the gala next week? I'm just pulling together all the last-minute stuff. My regular bartender cancelled on me last minute, so I've been scrambling to find a replacement. I'm sorry, I haven't been more help. Not that she would have allowed it. I'm handling everything just fine. His heart ached. How had they gotten this way? They used to be so close. It almost felt like the first conversation he'd had with her when they were mere strangers. He longed to take her in his arms and stroke her hair and tell her how much he adored her. But would she let him, or would she push him away? I've noticed that there are more men watching the museum and the house, she commented. Yes. 
My father has tripled his forces here. We don't want to take any chances. Wouldn't you just be safer in Mastonia at this point? Did she want him to leave? It felt like a shard of ice stabbing him in the heart to hear her suggest he return to his home country. I very well may be. My studies with your father are nearing an end, anyway. I most likely won't be in Maple Creek much longer. Oh. Carrington kept her voice even. Was she even upset? Hadn't her father said she was heartbroken? She didn't seem that way to him at all. That doesn't bother you? He couldn't help the emotion that was creeping into his voice. You wouldn't want me to stay? I told you I thought you needed to return to Mastonia so you weren't neglecting your duties to the throne. She walked past him into the kitchen. He longed to reach out to her as she passed him. But she probably wouldn't like that. I don't want to go back to Mastonia alone. She froze, her eyes wide. What are you saying? The words stuck in his throat. How could he say them and face her rejection? But he had to take the risk. I'm saying I'm in love with you. I can't let you walk away from me again. If you feel the same way, would you consider coming back to Mastonia with me? You're in love with me. She brought a hand to her mouth and her eyes filled with tears. Yes, I love you, Carrington Dalton. You do? Her eyes were so full of fear. I mean, are you sure? Of course, I'm sure. I've never been more sure of anything in my life. I've been miserable these past few weeks, without you. I've been miserable without you too. He crossed the room to where she stood. He placed his hands on her arms, and she looked up into his eyes. I'm sorry I compared you to all those shallow girls who only wanted me for my crown. You deserved better than that. I see that now. Please come with me to Mastonia. She looked back up at him, not speaking. Her eyes were full. His heart pattered in his chest. Please say something. She stood on her tiptoes and brought her mouth to his. His eyes slid closed, and he basked in her softness, her sweetness. He slid his hands around her back and pulled her closer. She pulled away just an inch and whispered, I love you too, Edward. He brought her back in for another kiss, this time more fervently. Edward clung to her like he was afraid she might change her mind. He couldn't lose her again. What do you say to coming back to Mastonia with me? I would love to go to Mastonia with you. Why don't we start with a visit and see where that goes? It wasn't the answer he was looking for, but he couldn't blame her either. She had her museum. And he hadn't exactly given her enough reason to trust him to want to pick up and move to another continent. Before I commit to anything, I want you to tell me the truth about who is after you. And don't tell me it'll just put me in danger. I think we can both agree that I'm already in danger. Knowing what's going on won't make it worse at this point. I'll tell you. Let's sit down. He took her hand and led her to the couch. They took a seat together. My younger brother Ramsey is after the throne. He wants me killed so he's next in line. Your brother is doing this to you? Carrington's eyes filled with fear. That's just messed up. I'm so sorry, Edward. I wish I could make it better. He took her hands in his. Say, you'll be mine then. She looked up into his eyes. I'm yours. He kissed her again. She pulled away. I don't care if people are after you. I want to be with you, anyway. It's not your fault that your brother is out to get you. The front door opened, and Richard came in with two boxes of pizza. I got pepperoni. He looked at them sitting so close together and a smile broke out across his face. What did I miss? Carrington smiled at him. It looks like I'm going to visit Mastonia. Chapter 16 Carrington walked into the crowded ballroom decorated for Christmas. A giant flocked tree, 
decked out with lights and ornaments and topped with a glittering silver star, stood in the corner of the room. White lights hung across the ceiling, and a flocked garland was draped around the giant fireplace on the south end of the ballroom. The full satin skirt of her red gown swished around her ankles, and she clutched a red satin purse with her gun inside, just in case. She'd visited the salon earlier that day, and Lauren had curled her hair, pulling some back with loose tendrils framing her face. Two security guards dressed in tuxes followed behind her. Edward had insisted that the security had to be tight for the event. He had men stationed around every entrance, dressed to blend into the crowd. Lauren was there already with her husband, Chase, by her side, the lead singer of Remington Sound. He'd kindly offered to perform with his band and was scheduled to do so later that night. Owen and Alexis Hadley waved at Carrington as she passed. Alexis reached out and grabbed her arm. This place looks like a winter wonderland, and you look amazing too. Lauren did a great job on your hair. Thank you. Carrington said. I'm so glad you could make it. Where's your Prince Charming? Alexis asked. I've heard so much about him. I'm dying to meet him. Edward should be here, but I haven't seen him yet. He's eager to meet you guys, too. I've told him all about you. He's a big fan of Owen's movies, and he loves his restaurant. You've thrown quite the party, Carrington, Owen said. She smiled at him. Thank you. We're hoping to raise money for a new roof for the museum. Well, you can count on a donation from us. We're more than happy to support you. Carrington felt tears welling in her eyes. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. Of course. You're like family to us, Owen said. The crowd parted, and she spotted Edward in his tuxedo, surrounded by guards. His broad shoulders filled out the coat in a way that had a blush creeping across her cheeks. He looked too good to stand. He turned and locked his gaze on hers. Excuse me, she told Owen. I see someone I need to speak with. Alexis followed her gaze. Is that him? Carrington nodded as Edward began crossing the room to them. Go see him, Alexis said. We'll catch up with you two later. A light smile touched her mouth as she stepped toward him. Can I have this dance? He extended his arm to her. His guards stood back to allow him to dance. She took his arm. Of course. He led her to the center of the dance floor. You look beautiful, he said, drawing her near as he began the steps to a waltz. I'm the luckiest man in the room. She'd had ballroom dance lessons in high school so she was able to keep up with him. I can't believe how many people showed up tonight, Carrington said. Between the race and the ticket sales from the gala, we'll almost have enough for the new roof. The night isn't over yet. I'm sure you'll get many more donations. That's my hope. We have had some come through on the new Donate Now button on the website. This is just the beginning. I see great things coming for your museum. Carrington smiled at him. You really are amazing, you know that, right? He grinned back at her, causing flutters in her chest. I'm glad you think so. You're pretty wonderful yourself. The song ended, and Carrington spotted Soraya and Kane coming into the room. Look who's here. Let's go talk to them. He led her toward the other couple. Carrington. Soraya said when she spotted Carrington. You look so beautiful. It's great to see you again, Edward. Carrington had filled her friend in on everything that had happened with Edward over a lunch at their favorite Mexican restaurant the previous Friday. Over the past week, she'd spent every spare moment with Edward. She'd only fallen deeper in love with him as each moment passed. It's great to see you too, and you, Kane. We're so glad you could come, Edward said. Everything looks so great, Soraya said, looking around. I can tell you've put a lot of work into the party. Edward had been a huge help over the past week. He'd worked hard to make up for lost time. Carrington and Edward walked around the room, greeting guests, charming them, telling them about the museum and what their hopes were. 
Will, the chief of police, greeted them with his wife, Layla, on his arm. Hey, you too, Carrington said. Thank you for donating the poinsettias from your shop, Layla. They go perfectly with the decorations. Layla beamed at her. Of course. I'm glad to help. We brought extra officers here tonight to ensure the safety of Maple Creek's finest, Will said. That definitely makes me feel safer. I know it's been a while since we've had an attack, but you can't be too careful. I feel the same way and am taking this situation seriously. She spotted Ellie over by the donation table. Should we go see how we're doing so far? Edward offered her his arm and he escorted her across the room. Hey, Ellie. How are the numbers looking? Carrington's employee was dressed in a light blue chiffon gown with her hair piled atop her head. She recognized the dress from Onyx's shop, where she'd gotten her dress as well. Onyx had told her that the gala had been excellent for her business with so many people in town looking for a formal. Ellie's eyes lit up. We've already hit our goal, and the night isn't over yet. At this rate, we'll have enough for the roof, and we can expand our collection as well. That's fantastic news. How are we able to do that? We've had some very large donors. Ellie glanced at Edward. Carrington followed her gaze. Why is she looking at you like that? Did you give a donation? Just a small one, Edward admitted, holding up his thumb and index finger an inch apart. It was nothing, really. But the Mastonian Crown is pleased to be an official sponsor of the museum. I can't believe you would do that. And why not? He stood closer to her until their noses touched. I'm a big fan, he pulled back and looked around the room. Of this museum. Oh, is that all? Carrington laughed. I happen to like the woman running it as well. Just like? He planted a kiss on her lips. Maybe a little bit more than like. You do realize you're in a public space, don't you? Some of us are trying to keep our food down. Carrington turned to see Sully smiling at her. She waved a hand at them. Just kidding. Keep being adorable. Sully had on a strapless purple gown that brushed the floor. Her jet black hair was down in loose waves that framed her face. Sully. We're so glad you came. You look amazing, Carrington said. I wouldn't miss it. Bryant was supposed to come too, but he had something come up. That was no surprise. It was common for Bryant to bail on her. He usually didn't offer any explanation for why he wouldn't show up, either. She'd come so far since she'd crushed on him. Now she understood that she deserved a guy who was there for her when it mattered. Edward and Carrington moved on to a few other couples, chatting and working to make the guests feel welcome. Would you like something to drink? Edward asked her when they had a break in conversation. I was going to go get a glass of champagne. She'd been able to find another bartender last minute. It wasn't a company she knew well, but Aubrey said she'd used them before for the Whitmore House, another wedding venue in town. Champagne sounds lovely, thank you. I'll just be in the ladies' room. She headed to the employee restroom she used down the hall near her office. The hallway was quiet and abandoned. It was a bit jarring after the noise of the ballroom. She went into the bathroom, and when she was finished, she washed her hands and touched up her makeup. When she was coming out, she heard a voice around the corner. Normally, she wouldn't have thought anything of it, but this man had an accent like Edward's. Mastonian and slightly familiar. Was it one of Edward's guards? Or was he one of Ramsay's men? Her heart pounded, and she flattened herself against the wall. She slowly peeked around the corner. It was one of Edward's men. The blonde one, Charles, if she remembered correctly. She let out a pent-up breath. She was getting paranoid. But then she caught some of his words. Yes, your highness. Tonight, we strike. Everything has gone according to plan. We were able to get the bartender in place. I just spotted Edward getting a drink. We've got him at last. 
the bartender? It sounded like Charles was in league with Ramsay. Were they planning to tamper with Edward's drink? She had to warn him. But how would she get past Charles without him knowing she'd heard everything he just said? She waited until he hung up the phone. Every second that ticked by was putting Edward in more danger. She glanced around the corner. Charles had left. Carrington walked out casually like nothing had happened and then rushed to find Edward. She could only hope he hadn't taken a drink of his champagne. She spotted him across the room. He had two glasses in his hands. She pushed past people as she rushed toward him. Edward, she called out. But the room was too noisy, and he didn't seem to hear her. Her pulse raced, and she kept pushing through the crowd. Edward. He looked around like he'd heard her, but still didn't seem to see her. He brought the glass to his lips, and she yelled one final time. The person next to him nudged Edward and pointed to Carrington. Edward lowered the glass and walked toward her. Don't drink that. She grabbed it from him. Why? I think it's been poisoned. Charles is working for your brother. I heard him on the phone with Ramsay. The bartender is one of them. Edward turned to the guard next to him. Did you know anything about this? No, your highness. Find Charles and have him detained immediately. Of course, your highness. Right away. I saw him last down that hallway. She pointed toward her office. The guard rushed off toward the hallway where Carrington had come from. All that time, Charles was working for the other side. He had plenty of chances to kill me. Why didn't he just do it then? Because I wanted to do it myself. A man with a hat pulled low over his face stepped behind Edward. Not so fast, big brother. You were supposed to drink the champagne, but you have to make everything so hard, don't you? Edward stiffened. The man had his hand to Edward's back, and it looked like he was holding a gun. Ramsay. Edward turned, but his brother spoke again. Don't move a muscle. It's over. Edward froze. You don't have to do this. Oh, but I do. Our country deserves better than someone who cares more for painting than actually ruling. We need a real leader. If Charles was on your side and you wanted to kill me yourself, then why were your men shooting at me at the race? They weren't shooting at you. They were shooting at your extra guard and were told to capture you alive. And why were you trying to poison me? Your drink wasn't poisoned. It was drugged. We were planning to take you somewhere more remote. Why now? So many questions. Heat scared. Just answer them. You're not in a position to make demands, Ramsay reminded him, jabbing the gun harder into his back, causing Edward to wince. If you must know, I've been hunted down in Mastonia for some time. Father isn't happy with me, and he's a difficult man to evade. It's taken some careful maneuvering to get to the U.S. I only recently was able to make it into town. And why do you want to kill me so badly? Do you know what it feels like to always live in the shadow of an older brother who gets everything you've ever dreamed of and doesn't care? If you'd wanted the throne, that would have been something, but you didn't care. All you wanted to do was paint. But none of that matters now because everything's about to be made right. You think father will allow you to rule after you murdered your brother? He won't have a choice. I'm next in line. He can strip you of your title. Ramsay barked a harsh laugh. Only if he's around to do it. He was plotting to kill the king too? Carrington couldn't stand by and allow this to happen. She looked around for a security guard. The place was swarming with them, but none of them seemed to notice that Edward was in trouble. The room was too crowded. Carrington's hand trembled at her side. She slowly put it into her purse and wrapped her hand around her gun. Whipping it out, she put it to Ramsay's back and cocked it. Drop your weapon. Ramsay laughed. What's this? Your little girlfriend comes armed? How unexpected. Not that it matters. 
She currently has five men aiming their weapons at her. Carrington looked around. She glimpsed at least one of the men hiding behind one of the pillars on the far side of the room. She swallowed. And you have a gun to your head. Any minute, Edward's guards will come back to his side. You won't get away with this. Her palm sweated beneath the gun in her hand. I'm not going to tell you again. Drop your weapon or die. Could she actually shoot this man? Her hand threatened to shake, but she held it steady at Ramsey's back. She began to squeeze the trigger, but then Ramsey lowered the gun from Edward's back. She pushed the gun into Ramsey's back harder. Let go of the weapon. Are you trying to start a war with the United States? Edward growled. You can't have men aiming weapons at U.S. citizens on their own soil. The Mastonian army wouldn't stand a chance against this superpower. It's already bad enough that you had your men shooting at the race. Have your men lower their weapons, Carrington demanded. Ramsey waved at his men, and the one Carrington had spotted earlier pointed his gun to the ground. She released a pent-up breath. The Royal Mastonian guards surrounded them. Two of them tackled Ramsey, throwing him to the floor, and handcuffed him. Will showed up with a team of police officers, and they scattered to track down Ramsey's men. Carrington threw her arms around Edward. I was so worried about you. She pulled back and kissed him. I'm so glad you're okay. Edward's eyes shone. You just put your own life in danger to save my life. And I would do it all over again. Your Highness, are you okay? Jason came running. We need to remove you from this situation immediately. No. I have something I need to do first. It involves Carrington. Your Highness, I highly recommend that we get you to safety, Jason insisted. Why don't I just come with you? Carrington suggested. I agree you should probably leave the premises. There are still shooters here. Give me just a moment. He leaned over and whispered in Jason's ear. He turned back to Carrington. Come with us. They went to Edward's car, and Carrington got in the back seat with him. Jason and another security guard got into the front seats. They drove through town and then got onto the interstate. What's going to happen to Ramsey? Carrington asked. We've taken him into custody. He'll be put in an American prison until he can be transported back to Mastonia. My father will have to deal with him, but I assure you, it won't be good for him. Do you think he'll lose his royal status? Carrington asked. Most likely. And he'll probably spend the rest of his days sitting in a prison cell. They sped past a couple of exits, before taking one. The driver took a turn onto a windy mountain road. Where are we going? Carrington asked. You'll see. We're improvising. They pulled over on the side of the road to a spot that overlooked Maple Creek off in the distance. Lights twinkled like candles on a birthday cake. How did you know about this place? Carrington asked. I discovered it a few weeks ago when I went exploring. It's beautiful. Edward took her hand and led her to a giant boulder. Have a seat. She scooted up onto the rock. Her dress fanned out around her, so she pulled her satin skirt toward her to make a spot for him to sit next to her. But instead of sitting, he fished something out of his pocket and pulled out a small box just as he bent down on one knee. He opened the box and pulled out a gorgeous diamond ring. Carrington gasped and covered her hands over her mouth. Carrington Dalton, you are the love of my life. My time with you in Virginia has been the happiest days I've known. When we're apart, my heart hurts, and I can hardly bear it. Please say you'll marry me and be my princess and future queen. I can't return to Mastonia without you by my side long term. Carrington squealed and jumped up from the rock, throwing her arms around him, practically knocking him over. Of course, I'll marry you. I thought you'd never ask. Edward stood and pulled her in and kissed her until her toes curled and her knees went weak. He handed her the ring, and she slid it onto her finger. It was a perfect fit. Soraya knew what size you wore, he admitted. 
she knew you were going to propose? Well, she owns the jewelry shop where I bought your ring. I had to swear her to secrecy. Carrington shook her head. I can't believe you want me to marry you. Me? Of all people. You're my match. Of course, I want to marry you. I can't even look at other women. I could never ask for someone more perfect for me. What are your parents going to say? They already know. And they're dying to meet you. And now they're going to find out that their future daughter-in-law just saved their son's life. They weren't upset that I'm not from some aristocratic family? I told them there was no choice for me, but you. But don't worry. We'll get you up to speed with Mastonian royal traditions. There will be time for all of that. What are we going to do about the museum? Do you have someone who could run it while you're in Mastonia? Well, Ellie would be my top choice. She's done an excellent job helping me set up the fundraisers. If you miss running a museum, you could get involved with the one in Mastonia. We could even feature your father's artwork there. Carrington's heart swelled. That would be a dream come true. She felt tears spring to her eyes. Thank you, Edward. He brushed a tendril of hair back from her forehead before kissing her nose. It's only a small part of what I plan to do for you. You'll see. There's so much more. I can't wait to start my life with you. She never imagined this much happiness coming into her life. But there was only more to come. Hey guys, this is Cindy Ray Hale. Thank you so much for listening to Her Prince's Secret Past. If you could just hit the like button and the subscribe button, I would super appreciate it. Um, make sure that you do that because you'll want to stick around. I have uh, more content that I'll be uploading, free audiobooks for you guys, and more bonus videos talking about the behind the scenes um, parts of these books and what this publishing journey has been like for me. And um, if you want to see what life in Macedonia is like for Carrington, I also offer a bonus epilogue for this book. All you have to do is sign up for my newsletter and then it will be delivered to your inbox. And uh, the link for that is in the description below. And um, that's it. Just thanks so much. And I hope you guys enjoy more books from me. Thanks.